Lucy in the Sky with Asteroids. In L-34 minutes, this Atlas V rocket will send Lucy on the first ever space mission to study the Trojan asteroids, which share Jupiter's orbit around the Sun. Named after the Lucy fossil, the spacecraft will visit eight asteroids over 12 years as we seek to uncover the mysteries of our solar system's formation. Welcome and thank you for joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center on the east coast of Florida. I'm Daryl Nail. we got a great launch for you. That's right, and I'm Marie Lewis, and we are both uh, vaccinated against COVID-19, which is why we're not wearing masks since we're outside. Launch is set for 534 this morning, Eastern Time, from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. And we are at L-32 minutes and counting. No spacecraft has ever been to the Trojan asteroids. They are considered fossils of planet formation and may hold clues about our ancient past. With boosts from Earth's gravity, Lucy will fly very close to eight asteroids over her 12-year journey. Just as the Lucy fossil has been extensively studied, the Lucy spacecraft promises to teach us about our solar system's evolution, including Earth. Now, no other space mission in history has visited as many different destinations in independent orbits around our sun. And we'll talk with the experts about Lucy's unprecedented journey ahead. That's right. And we'll also hear from the man who discovered the ancient Lucy fossil in Ethiopia in 1974. We'll learn about a special time capsule associated with this mission. Plus, we'll hear directly from the scientists who've spent years working towards this day. And to help us tell their story, we have commentators at the United Launch Alliance Atlas Space Flight Operations Center, or ASOC as we call it. We also have folks on the roof of that building and at a nearby viewing location. First, let's introduce you to the team of commentators who will be calling Joshua Santos Waltman. Guys, how's it going over there? Hey, it's going uh, almost... Uh, unnervingly well. Uh, every knock on wood. Start knocking on wood. Uh, but I'm joined here with Mick Waltman, the chief of fleet, uh, fleet Systems Integrations. Mick, always a pleasure to have you with me. Joshua, thanks. It's an exciting time this morning. As you said, it's been a pretty quiet count so far. The teams came on you know, several hours ago and started preps uh, to get the vehicle ready. And things are looking great. I mean, the, everything's go so far this morning. We are in this T-4 hold. And the team is finishing up topping and, and doing their work. So uh, looking forward to that T-0. Yeah, it's coming up here. We're on track still for the first uh, first opportunity of a 75-minute window. Uh, but again, we finished. We started fueling uh, about two hours ago, and then uh, just about 30 minutes ago, we got into a topping phase with all of our fuels and oxidizers, uh, which basically means that we're at a point where the vehicle's fueled, it's ready. Uh, they're simply going through final checkouts and processes, stabilizing and making sure that we're we're good to go here. Um, Obviously, under the beautiful Lucy spacecraft today, we've got the Centaur upper stage and then the, the Atlas booster. Mick, a unique Atlas booster not originally intended for this flight. Yeah, that's true. Uh, when we started this mission, uh, the first stage of this uh, Atlas 401 configuration was originally allocated for the OFT2, or Orbital Flight Test 2 mission, uh, that was earlier this year. However, due to some manifest things that went on and due to the nature of Lucy and the planetary window, uh, we had to work with the United United Launch Alliance to uh, reallocate that booster, reconfigure a little bit, and uh, get it ready for this morning's uh, launch. So the booster, of course, reallocated from OFT, but the Centaur is brand new for this mission. And uh, as you were saying earlier, finishing up topping, we're getting about 740,000 pounds of fuel on board once we finish fueling here, get ready for launch this morning. Yeah, so things progressing well. A lot of what's left is to get Lucy ready to be living on her own and flying free. Um, and so as we look ahead to the countdown, we have a few things coming up, including a weather, weather check. Uh, we also have the spacecraft moving to internal power uh, and lots more to come. We're excited. So even beyond liftoff today, stay with us. Um, I think that's going to do it for us for the moment. Again, lots more to come ahead. Uh, Marie, we're going to send it back to you. Over to you. All right. Thank you, Joshua and Mick. Uh, we are now at L minus 28 minutes, 25 seconds and counting. The Trojan asteroids Lucy will visit are named after characters in Homer's famous poem, The Iliad. They are called Patroclus, Menetius, Euripides, Oris, Lucas, and Polymely. And the main belt asteroid Lucy will visit is called Donald Johansson, after the man who discovered the Lucy fossil. Now the eighth asteroid, Keta, is a small satellite of Euripides. 
Keta was named after the first woman to light the Olympic cauldron, Norma Enriqueta Basilio Sotelo. We'll show you how Keta was discovered a little later after launch. Right now we are L minus 27 minutes and counting. Lucy is inside the payload fairing, sitting on top of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket on pad 41. We want to show you what she'll look like once she's flying free in space. Lucy is more than 46 feet long, about the size of a large RV. Most of that length is from her huge solar panels, each almost 24 feet long. Lucy has a six and a half foot antenna with which she communicates with Earth. And there are three main instruments for remote sensing. Fully fueled, she weighs 3,417 pounds, a little heavier than a mid-sized car, and most of that weight is fuel. Yeah, those solar arrays are really impressive. And studying the Trojan asteroids from hundreds of millions of miles away requires a highly advanced set of instruments. Let's learn more about what's on board, Lucy. The Lucy spacecraft will be taking a journey where no other spacecraft has gone before, the Trojan asteroids. The Trojans are two groups of asteroids that lead and trail Jupiter in its orbit around the Sun, and they've been trapped in these stable locations for over four billion years. Lucy will have a suite of scientific instruments for collecting data as it flies by the asteroids. The LORI is a long-range reconnaissance imager. It's often referred to as Lucy's eagle eyes, since it has the highest spatial resolution of all of Lucy's cameras. This black and white camera is actually a type of telescope, the same kind as the Hubble Space Telescope. The LORI was built to produce clear images of the Trojan's craters, which will be a challenge since the Trojan asteroids are extremely dark. The LORI will be able to see 75-yard wide craters from over 600 miles away. That's like standing at one end of a football field and being able to see a fly at the other end. The instrument's simple design does not use optical filters and includes no moving parts, reducing the risk of part failure during the mission. The LORI will also search the Trojans for evidence of any rings and new satellites. The instrument's ability to see faint targets from far away also makes it perfect for optical navigation. The LORI will help Lucy navigate to a point in space, and then a terminal tracking camera aboard the spacecraft, known as T2CAM, will help the instruments accurately point towards the targets. LATES is Lucy's thermal emission spectrometer, which detects far infrared radiation emitted by the asteroids due to how they are heated up by sunlight. LATES detects this radiation using a small telescope to focus the incoming energy onto a detector, similar to the way a remote thermometer works. So, the test is not taking images, but rather temperature measurements at various points on the asteroid. This data will be combined so that scientists can get an understanding of its surface properties. The test will examine the properties of the regolith on the surface by measuring thermal inertia, which is the measure of how slowly the asteroid heats up from sunlight, and then releases that heat. By taking the temperature readings at different parts of the asteroid, the Lucy science team can measure the thermal inertia and figure out how much dust, sand, or rock is present on the asteroid's surface. That data will tell us a lot about how the asteroid was formed, providing insight into the history of our solar system. Lucy's Le Ralph instrument will search the Trojans for organics, ices, and hydrated minerals, and will help determine the surface compositions of the asteroids. Le Ralph is actually two instruments in one, and together they will measure and analyze the spectra of light absorbed and reflected by the asteroid. The first is a color visible imager, the Multispectral Visible Imaging Camera, or MVIC. It takes visible light color images of the Trojan asteroids. The second is an infrared imaging spectrometer, known as LISA, the Linear Edelon Imaging Spectral Array, which collects infrared spectra of the asteroids. Like LaLori, LaRalph does not have a focusing mechanism. Instead, it is designed to stay in focus despite the extreme temperature differences in space by being made almost entirely from a single block of aluminum. As you can see, the Lucy spacecraft has a large suite of tools to study the Trojan asteroids, which will help us better understand the formation of our solar system.
You may have noticed in that video that each of Lucy's instruments has an L added to the beginning of its name. That's meant to designate their attachment to Lucy. And now we're going to hear from the deputy principal investigator for the Lucy mission. She is standing by with NASA's Megan Cruz at the nearby Operations Support Building 2. That's our launch viewing location. Megan, how's it going over there? Hey, Murray, things are looking really great, and it just got better now that I'm joined with Kathy Olkin. Kathy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Lucy is a very ambitious mission. Where did the idea for Lucy come about? The idea for Lucy was really to explore the Trojan asteroids. The scientific community has been wanting to see these objects up close for a long time. And so we finally have a mission that's almost on its way. Yeah, this is really exciting. And I mean, the goal is to study how the outer planets formed. But why is that important for us to understand? Yeah, it's really important to understand solar system formation, uh, to understand where we came from and how our solar system works. It used to be that we had a vision that the solar system was a very calm uh, environment and that everything was very stable. But really our recent ideas are that it's not like that at all. Mm. It's very, it had been very chaotic in mm. the early solar system history and that caused small bodies in the solar system many to be ejected out of the solar system oh, wow. and a small fraction to be captured in the Trojan asteroids. Gotcha, gotcha. And it's going to take a very complex trajectory right to get to these Trojan asteroids. I imagine that must have been really difficult to plot out four billion miles over 12 years. It really was. It <laughs> took the whole team to be able to make this amazing trajectory that really enables the mission. On the science side we started with a list of objects that we wanted to compare against each other. And then we handed that off to the mission designers and they ran with it and they found an amazing trajectory. And then the people who optimized the trajectory did their work. And so it's really an uh, effort from the whole team that got us this awesome trajectory. Perfect. And a quick last question. Why eight asteroids? That's a record-breaking number. It is a record-breaking number and we really needed to go by eight asteroids to really explore the diversity of these objects. There's more red and less red. There's smaller and larger objects. There's objects that we're going to be visiting that are remnants from a giant collision and also a primitive pair, a binary pair that orbits each other. So in order to look at, make all those comparisons, we needed to go past eight asteroids. Kathy, thank you so much. It sounds so exciting. And honestly, it's so, we're so lucky because the weather looks so great right now. Right, Daryl? Hey, Megan, the weather is cooperating wonderfully. You can't see it because it's dark out, right. um, but we've got great weather. Had a little bit of rain coming in. Mm -hmm. Just um, a little sprinkle. Just a little sprinkle, but uh, it looks clear overall. Let's take a look out at the live shot of our pad and the rocket, and you can see there it is looking beautiful in the light. Just a note for you in the upper left-hand corner, there's the L minus time, L minus 19 minutes and counting. Across the bottom, the progress bar, you see we are in a T minus 4 hold. More on that in a bit. But we're talking weather now, as you can see, clear through the dark. Uh, this is so that ground teams and launch teams can see what's going on with that illuminated pad and monitor what's happening around the rocket. Let's talk more about the weather. And yeah, we had a little bit of rain earlier, Will Ulrich, our launch weather officer. But overall, this is looking fantastic from a forecast perspective. That's right, Daryl. Really, all things considered, we couldn't be asking for better weather early this morning. The sprinkles that you mentioned have since cleared the area, and now all we're left with is partly cloudy skies and light winds, thanks in part to an area of high pressure that remains dominating over the southeastern United States. A live look at satellite imagery behind me shows those mostly clear skies across much of the state, and that's going to make for a great viewing opportunity, regardless of whether you're watching in Jacksonville, Tampa, Orlando, or locally right here in the Space Coast. My colleague Jessica Williams just gave her final weather brief at L-30 minutes to United Launch Alliance, Eastern Range, and NASA officials and gave a greater than 90% go for weather, so we are not tracking any issues at this time. As a reminder, my colleagues and I are here to ensure that the weather is safe for launch, and we do that through the evaluation of 10 lightning launch commit criteria, which are designed to protect against both rocket triggered and natural lightning. In addition, we also monitor user weather constraints like surface wind speed and precipitation. And while things are looking really good for launch this morning, should we need to utilize tomorrow's backup window, we do anticipate conditions deteriorating as we see a cold front move through the region. 
But let's not worry about that right now because conditions are looking great. Mother Nature is giving her thumbs up and I'm happy to report that the 45th Weather Squadron is go for weather. Daryl? Great update about the weather outside. Thank you, Will. We are currently L minus 17 minutes and counting until liftoff. Asteroids are prehistoric treasures that hold the lost stories about our origin of the solar system. Here's what else you need to know about Trojan asteroids. This mission is such an incredible opportunity and one of the many missions aimed at asteroid research right now. Let's head back out to NASA's Megan Cruz, who is with the head of NASA Science Missions. Megan. I am Daryl. Joining us right now is Dr. Thomas Zerbuk, and he's the Associate Administrator for NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Good to have you here this morning. I'm so glad to be here. What an exciting morning. It is, and I'm so glad you're here because i got to ask you a question. You know, first off, tell me a little bit about the Science Mission Directorate. What's the goal there? Well, so we're the organization at NASA that does all science, you know, and it, of course, is planetary science, just like we're launching today. It's also astrophysics. I just got a picture of the James Webb Space Telescope that in the crate there in Kuru getting ready for launch and then it's the earth science, heliophysics, also uh, biological and physical sciences. That's all the science we do at the agency. Just an amazing amount. Yeah, and when you became associate administrator of the um, science mission directorate, Lucy was the first mission you selected. Why is that? Well, so the timing was there. We had five mission candidates and I have to tell you, it was the first, it's the, one of these amazing decisions and, and of course many people helped with that. But I looked at this and this orbit and the uh, signs were so compelling. I said, we got to fly this. Yeah, the trajectory is amazing. I mean, the fact that we've been able to figure out how to get to the Trojan asteroids in, in relatively a short amount of time. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, it's so innovative, right? I mean, we actually, the science community had said, we want to do this, but we want to spend a half a billion or a billion dollars more than this team proposed. It's like, this is good money. Let's go do this. The, it's really innovative. Absolutely. And how does Lucy tie into NASA's overall asteroid research that's going on right now? Well, we're really starting a decade of asteroid science, right? We're launching in 23. Uh, OSIRIS-REx is bringing back the samples of Bennu down kind of in, in Utah. We'll, we'll come down there. Next year, we're going to be here again and launch Psyche. And just later this year, we're going to launch DART, which is the first collision experiment uh, trying to really deflect a potentially threatening uh, asteroid. You know? so, so for us, it's many parts. And, ex you know, and of course, at the heart of it, Lucy, is just absolutely the mission of discovery. Yeah, we're really doing a lot of amazing things, and I think that you have a lot to do with that. So thank you so much, Dr. Zerbuk, and I really appreciate you being here today. Appreciate it, Megan. Thanks so much. Awesome. Daryl, back to you. All right. Thank you, Megan. And we're just seconds away from the NASA launch manager poll, so let's get out to Joshua and Mick to pick it up. Guys? 
Hey, thanks, Daryl. Yes, uh, things, again, proceeding really well. Uh, appreciate the report from Will Ulrich because the weather is always the other side of the coin, right? We got the launch team in the technical. We got the weather in good shape. Uh, as you see there, the rocket venting and uh, having the condensation appear around the rocket as we would typically expect. So everything healthy and, and on track. Uh, like Daryl just mentioned, we will hear from Omar Baez, the NASA launch manager. He'll be polling the NASA team so that he can in turn report out on the ULA launch conductor poll that will happen a few minutes later. Uh, so that should happen right here at L minus 13 minutes. Let's listen in for that now. This is the NLM on the NLM net, uh, just providing an update. The uh, range did uh, notify us that uh, one side of uh, the JDMTA uh, command site. Hey, so let's go ahead and uh, uh, we're going to step away from that for now. Um, and we're going to, obviously there's something developing there. Uh, we were expecting to get that poll. And so we want to be respectful of what's happening there. The technical data, we're not sure that that's going to be approved for release. Uh, so obviously we'll be standing by to, to pay attention to that and give you updates as we understand more. Uh, but do want to kind of get back on track with talking about the, uh, oh, we are hearing that we think Omar is going to pick up with this poll. Coming up now. NASA CE, go. SMA? SMA, go. SMD? SMD, go. NASA Mission Manager? NASA Mission Manager, go. LSP? LSP is go. Copy that. The NASA team's ready to release the hold at T minus four minutes. Yes, yeah, so Joshua, what we heard there from uh, NASA Launch Manager Omar Baez is he was basically just briefing his NASA team and spacecraft customer of an issue that the team, uh, that the range had notified them of with one of their downrange assets. It sounds, looks like it was uh, partially mission capable today. The team accepted that and uh, they are ready to move forward as you heard in the poll that all systems are go for the NASA side. And uh, we'll be picking that up uh, as uh, launch conductor Scott Barney does his poll here in a little bit. Yeah, always a lot of things in play. Uh, we uh, will continue to track that. Again, a great sign that the team was able to work through that and approve uh, to move forward. Um, so we'll be back in a few minutes bringing you the final steps of the countdown uh, and a report up as we transition Lucy into internal power. Uh, but for now, Daryl, back to you. All right, thank you, Joshua and Mick. Lucy is going to visit as many asteroids in the faraway belt of Jupiter as we've ever discovered for near-Earth asteroids. And to get there, Lucy will need the right rocket and the right trajectory to carry out this historic mission. We headed out to ULA's Vertical Integration Facility, where inside we were awestruck after walking onto a platform 18 stories above the ground, because just a few feet away was the Lucy spacecraft, inside its protective fairing and on top of an Atlas V rocket. ULA was making final preparations to roll this entire launch vehicle out of the vertical hangar we were in and onto the launch pad. Domaine Oliver, good to see you, my good man. You too. Hey, thanks for coming out here and telling us about this flight trajectory and all the fun facts about Lucy going up in space. It's my pleasure. So, Jermaine, you are a flight design analyst with Launch Services Program. You know this flight pretty well. Tell me first about why we're launching at this specific time of year. We're trying to rendezvous with two different sets of asteroids that are on the Jupiter line, you know, Jupiter orbit. So in order to do that, you have to launch at a particular time to line up where the asteroids are going to be at, because if you don't, you'll either get there too early or get there too late. Can you believe how close we're standing here next to this space? I've never been this close before. This is great. Let me ask you about this fairing. What's its purpose? The fairing purpose is to encapsulate the satellite throughout, you know, throughout the time it's going through the atmosphere until it gets into space. So let's talk a little bit about the orbit. So this spacecraft is going out 530 million miles away from the sun. That's far, and it takes a careful orbit to get there. Yes, what happens is you have to use Earth gravity assist to slingshot yourself to each of the different asteroid trojans. So Lucy weighs about the same weight as a mid-sized vehicle, 3,400 pounds or so. Yeah. So it's pretty heavy. What kind of thrust does this rocket need to get it up off the ground and into space. Max thrust on this particular rocket is about 930,000 pounds of thrust and it get Lucy on a trajectory that's going about maybe 27,000, 28,000 miles per hour. Tell me about this rocket configuration, the Atlas 401. It's just a four meter fairing that works great for this mission because given the spacecraft's weight about 1,500 kilograms and where it's going, 
the energy that, that is going to this particular rocket fits perfectly with it. I'm really excited about the journey as it begins right here, right now, with this entire rocket and spacecraft rolling out to the pad. That's pretty cool. Yes, it is. I've never seen it before, actually. I'll be, I'm excited to see how this goes today. You want to jump on and ride with the oh, LME? No, thank you. I'm fine. Thank you pass on that? I'm okay. Okay. Oh, look there. It's moving. Check it out. Well, Lucy's journey has begun. Isn't it amazing? Yes, it is. Lucy's on our way. Charmaine Oliveira with Launch Services Program. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it was a pleasure being here. Thank you for having me. And as that rolled out, we had to take some pictures and uh, even yeah. a selfie because, you know what, I feel like we're the last people to be that close to that spacecraft, spacecraft going so far away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and few people get to be at the base of the pad. Even fewer get to be inside the VIF, especially at that moment of rollout. So that was a really cool it opportunity awesome. that you had. Yeah. All right. We are uh, inside of L-8 minutes and coming up on the launch conductor pole shortly. So we want to hand it over to Joshua and Mick to take us the rest of the way through the countdown. Joshua? Hey, thanks, Marie. Uh, I'd love to say that rocketry is a team sport, uh, and that's what we're going to get to kind of hear with this launch conductor poll in just a minute. Four major teams that play this morning, NASA Launch Services Program responsible for the launch, United Launch Alliance providing the vehicle, the ride to space. We have the uh, Southwest Research Institute, the NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, and Lockheed Martin, part of the spacecraft team, and then the Space Force. Yeah, Joshua, we're very happy to have Space Force here as they uh, protect the range and look at the weather. They're also responsible for vehicle and personnel safety today. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems, propulsion. Behind. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Hazgas. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ACS. Go. Red line monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. ALC, verify T0 is set for 0934 Zulu. Verified. So Joshua set a very successful poll there by launch conductor Scott Barney. As you also heard, we verified that T0 is set for uh, 0934 Zulu time. That's 534 local. Uh, very happy to hear everybody green and go. And in, in particular, our friends at the range there, uh, our Space Force friends, uh, gave a clear for the range today. That's awesome. They're doing their job not only with weather but the safety. Uh, we also heard a little earlier in the count this morning that the range reported there are no colas this morning, which are collision avoidance uh, assessments. So we are good for our first initial part of the launch window this morning, 534. All steps are complete prior to terminal count. Yeah, big thanks to the Space Launch Delta 45 folks for all their support. Uh, so looking ahead to terminal count, we just heard the call that the spacecraft is configured for flight. That includes being transitioned to internal power. Uh, and then, like I mentioned before, the next few steps are all about getting the launch vehicle and the spacecraft uh, able to live on their own. So those are the things coming up here. Uh, we do have this release of the built-in hold. Uh, the eagle-eyed viewers that can see behind us might have noticed that there's a clock sitting at T minus four minutes and holding. Uh, it's been that way for our entire show so far. That will then sync up with our L clock you see on screen at this moment, and those will count towards zero together. Again, everything looking great for liftoff on time here at, at uh, 5.34. Yeah, Joshua, as we come out of this hold, uh, you know, what's very impressive this morning is this Atlas 401. We heard Jarmaine talk about it. It's a 401 configuration, a four-meter fairing, zero solids on it, and one single uh, Centaur engine on the second stage. Uh, this is a great uh, configuration for the Lucy mission. It is the most common flown uh, configuration by United Launch Alliance, and uh, this will be the, the 89th. Uh, Atlas V uh, launching, so we're very proud of that. Two, one, mark. And there we go, the clocks are released, so we are ticking down here uh, towards liftoff. Five. Ground pyro is enabled. Yeah, we'll hear the team securing a lot of their things, getting their final configurations in place, and making sure the rocket's ready for a T-0 liftoff this morning, so the team will be working very quickly. 
Yeah, and uh, opposed to the missions that we might be used to with where we're hitting a low Earth orbit trajectory, uh, this one is going into deep space, and so we'll be exceeding uh, escape velocity of Earth this morning. Uh, so that's up and over 25,000 miles per hour. We know that over the course of Lucy's mission, she will get up to about 400,000 miles per hour. So very, very fast with all those Earth uh, gravity assists. And for those that are in the physical area, uh, you'll also notice that this rocket will take a little bit more of a southern track than we're typically used to seeing. We usually see rockets take off more towards the northeast. This one will move a little bit more towards the southeast than is typical. Yeah, and with that southerly trajectory, uh, people ought to be able to see some great things with the weather the way it is today. Three minutes. So Alice tanks to flight pressure. Securing LO2 topping. 250. FTS internal. So there we heard the teams uh, securing the uh, topping and bringing the Atlas tanks to flight pressure. That's a huge milestone as we get ready for T0 this morning. The teams have finished putting locks and hydrogen on board and making sure that uh, all that 740,000 pounds of fuel is there for liftoff of Lucy. We also heard that the team uh, brought in the flight termination system arm. That is part of the range safety that is needed for the vehicle as we lift off this morning. Yeah, previewing what's, co what's to come ahead, so stay with us after liftoff. We'll be tracking with a couple burns of the Centaur, uh, spacecraft separation, those beautiful solar arrays deploying, and then signal, uh, acquisition of signal will kind of be the end of our, our show for you today, beginning a 12-year, 4-billion-mile journey for Lucy. Absolutely. 159. Vehicle internal. 155. Launch sequencer start. 150. Securing Centaur LH2. Securing Centaur LO2. 140. Launch enabled. 137. FTS armed. 90 seconds to go. One twenty. OCU's armed. FCS count started. One ten. Vent valves locked. One minute. Rock report range status. Range green. All right, so stay with us again after liftoff. Uh, we'll also have the voice chiming in from uh, Rob Kesselman from ULA. Uh, he'll be providing the launch vehicle ascent data. Forty. Stable at step three. So that's a great uh, sign right there, stable at step three. Everything is at flight pressures. We're now the only thing left, Joshua, is that final status check uh, with the whole team. 25 seconds. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go Lucy. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Lift off. Atlas five takes flight sending Lucy to uncover the fossils of our solar system. Tower clear. Body 180 propellant utilization has gone to close loop control. The vehicle has begun the pitch yaw roll maneuver. Now, 30 seconds into flight, vehicle is 0.6 miles in altitude, traveling at 939 miles per hour. Body 180 performance continues to look good at this time. Engine pump speeds and injector pressures are in family for this thrust level. Vehicle attitude remains stable at this time. Attitude rates are near zero in all, in all axes. Now at T plus 70 seconds into flight, vehicle is 4 miles in altitude, 0.2 miles downrange distance, traveling at 1,200 miles per hour. Mach 
Core and Alice is now supersonic. Vehicle is now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. The vehicle is now throttling down slightly. engine parameters continue to look nominal after the prior adjustment to the thrust level. Approximately two minutes remain in the Atlas booster phase of flight. The Atlas V rocket weighs now just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of 2,600 pounds per second. Vehicle is now executing closed loop steering. Center 5 Center Reaction Control System is now pressurizing the flight levels. So beautiful launch sequence there. Uh, we do have uh, another minute and a half or so to go with the booster in operation, uh, getting uh, loose. We're now just under three minutes into flight. Atlas is 33 miles in altitude, 59 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,600 miles per hour. So Lucy being lifted up out of the atmosphere by the booster, getting on its way into a park orbit uh, before we get towards... Uh, All first stage vehicle systems are operating as expected at this time. Future, uh, future portions of the launch activity, we have the Centaur multiple burns ahead and spacecraft separation. And the big milestone we should see Josh coming up is booster engine cutoff, which would be the first stage cutoff and then stage The main separation. engine is now throttling to maintain a constant 5G acceleration limit. We're going to see a few things happen pretty rapidly. The, the booster will cut off just after four minutes. And then within the next 15 seconds after that, we should see the Atlas separate from the Centaur and then the Centaur engine ignite for its first burn. Centaur has begun the boost phase chill down sequence. And the RD-180 is now throttling to maintain a constant 4.6 G acceleration limit. Boost phase chill down sequence has completed. And we have Pico booster engine cutoff and a successful stage separation event. So what you're seeing on screen is uh, an animation that's being driven by actual telemetry. Please on the RL-10. So we are watching these things uh, in an animation happen here, but they're happening in real time as well. And that's one. We have ignition for the first burn. All right, so there we go. Uh, we should see the, fair, the fairing jettison here. We have indication of good payload fairing jettison. And there we go. All right, Nick, so that wraps up the, the first round of, of major milestones here. Uh, still very much in the middle of dynamic flight. The uh, fuel system on the RL-10 is now in an open-loop burn-off mode to burn off excess fuel in the early portion of this burn. So walk us quickly through, Mick, what are we looking for uh, in, the next, in this burn and the next one? So this burn is going to end with uh, Miko uh, getting uh, Centaur and Lucy into its park orbit around Earth. And then we will then get into MESS-2, which will get us into that transfer orbit, getting Lucy on its way. Awesome. So that's going to do it for now, uh, finishing up the initial launch activities, everything sounding like it's going perfectly. Uh, Daryl, back to you. Thank you, Joshua and Mick. A beautiful launch out here from our vantage point. Incredible. All right. Lucy was built at the Lockheed Martin facility in Colorado before arriving at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station for launch. Engineers at Lockheed's Waterton facility use lessons learned from prior spacecraft like New Horizons and OSIRIS-REx to build Lucy. And in July, Lucy was packed up and flown on board a United States Air Force C-17 cargo plane from Colorado to the launch and landing facility runway at the Kennedy Space Center. From there, Lucy was transported to an Astrotech Space Operations Processing Facility in nearby Titusville for final preparations before liftoff. Yeah, just a few miles from here before it was brought to the pad. For more about how Lucy was built, let's send it over to NASA's Megan Cruz. 
Hey, Daryl. Yeah, right now I'm joined by Ari Vogel. He's the Deep Space Exploration Director at Lockheed Martin Space. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks so much for having me. Wasn't that just a beautiful launch? What did you think about that? Incredible. You know, seeing it go over the clouds and bright up, brighten up the whole sky was just fantastic. Yeah, to see it rise over the clouds. Because, you know, we lost it a little bit because of some cloud coverage, but then it just rose out of it. It was so beautiful. And, yeah. you know, I really wanted to talk to you because you, your team at Lockheed Martin Space knew that you were going into a project that would require you to develop a spacecraft that would travel farther than any other solar-powered spacecraft yeah. ever. I mean, was that intimidating? You know, it was a, it was a really exciting challenge to, to solve, right? And obviously, the most prominent feature of Lucy is their big solar arrays. Each one is about the length of a bus. And, um, you know, what we did is we basically just broke the problem down into smaller pieces and then applied systems thinking to make sure that the design trades we were doing uh, didn't impact or that we fully understood the impacts for over the 12-year mission. So, you know, being the farthest uh, solar-powered spacecraft is certainly something that was difficult to prepare for, um, as is going to a record eight asteroids in one mission. Uh, but that's why we have such a comprehensive test like you fly program at Lockheed Martin and we took it through the ringer at our facility in Denver. Yeah, and you did it all within 14 months. That's during a pandemic. That's incredible. Can you talk to me about the challenges of that? Yeah, you know, it's it's really awe-inspiring. I mean, to, to be able to, to build a one-of-a-kind one spacecraft during normal circumstances is incredible. And the team just really pulled together, didn't miss a beat connected and collaborated, you know, made sure that we didn't uh, didn't have any mistakes. And it really accelerated some of our digital transformation initiatives too, having to, to work during the pandemic. And not a single shift was missed during integration and test due wow. to COVID. So team just did an awesome job, leadership with the preparation and the over communication and the transparency. And then all the team, you know, just didn't let their commitment to, to Lucy waver. And I think the thing that I'm most proud about, actually, is, is that through it all, we still continue to all of our STEM events, all our mentoring, our coaching, uh, Lockheed Martin, NASA, Southwest Research in Institute, hundreds of thousands of hours in, into that. So it was really, really a great job. And really quick, you also built the antenna that's on there that's going to help us communicate with Lucy. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we did. A uh, six and a half foot uh, wide antenna that, that we built. Main job is to, is to do the communication between the spacecraft. And, um, you know, it's also going to send back some of the first images of the Trojans. So I the whole team is super excited yeah, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank yeah. you so much, Ari. I really appreciate you being here today so and much. for bringing Lucy to life. So thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, Daryl, back to you. All right, thank you, Megan. And in case you're just joining us, we here at uh, NASA are at the beginning of Lucy's 530-mile journey to the Trojan asteroids beyond the sun, going to the same orbit, Marie, as Jupiter. That's right. It was a beautiful launch here. We could see it light up the water behind us, and we actually had a gator in the water just behind us. Oh, <laughs> joining us too. for liftoff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, jo Lucy is named after a skeleton fossil more than 3 million years old. Lucy was an early human ancestor, and the Trojan asteroids are fossils, too, of how planets were formed. Beyond the asteroid belt are fossils of planet formation, known as the Trojan asteroids. These primitive bodies share Jupiter's orbit in two vast swarms, leading and trailing the planet. Now, NASA is preparing to visit seven asteroids. Embarking on a 12-year odyssey that will span Jupiter's orbit. One mission will explore these objects for the first time. Lucy, the first mission to the Trojan Asteroids. And uh, another special guest that we had watching the launch from the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center was none, on our, none other than uh, NASA's Associate Administrator, Bob Cabana. He is standing by with uh, Blair Allen of NASA EDGE. Um, actually, uh, they're telling me that we lost audio uh, with that group, so we will... 
We will come back to that um, if we can, but uh, while they try to work out their audio issues. But Daryl, uh, you know, we had we had a really unmatched view of of launch here. It was just spectacular. Yeah, it was incredible because uh, we're sitting. You can't really tell, but this behind us is the Kennedy Basin, right. the Turn Basin, where they brought in, uh, you know, the space shuttle uh, main uh, tank, mm -hmm. as well as just recently uh, the core stage for the Artemis rocket, which is in uh, the VAB right now getting stacked. You're looking at the flight of Centaur and Lucy. We are L plus 11 minutes and 26 seconds as we cruise along and we want to talk a little bit now about the message that Lucy is going to be sending. That's right. Uh, Lucy is carrying something on board. Um, aside from her scientific instruments, she's got something a little more philosophical. There is actually a plaque affixed to the side of the Lucy spacecraft, and it contains quotes and messages from artists, poets, and thought leaders. And the plaque is meant to serve as a time capsule of sorts for our own descendants. You see, after Lucy's 12-year mission is complete, the spacecraft will remain on a stable orbit, traveling back and forth between the Earth and the Trojan asteroids for perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. And one day, in the distant future, our descendants may be able to retrieve Lucy. Uh, there it is, this, the, uh, the plaque you can see on mm. the side of the spacecraft. Wow. This was uh, before uh, Lucy was packed inside the payload fairing. Uh, but this is meant to be uh, a relic for our, an for our descendants uh, of the early days of humanity's exploration of the solar system. Uh, and when they do, they will see some great messages. We'll see those. Uh, we'll talk more about those in just a couple of minutes. We um, oh, we actually yeah. have. We do have it. Yeah. Um, so this is um, a representation. It's hidden a little bit behind your computer, Daryl. Oh, yeah, um, let me get that down. <laughs> Yeah. But this is the actual plaque on the spacecraft is about a tenth of the size of this, so this is blown up. Yeah. Um, but it's got um, a diagram on it. This shows the positions of the planets as they are today on the day of the Lucy launch. That's right, and there are some great quotes. You mentioned some of the great philosophers and uh, thought leaders over time. Down at the bottom left, you can see... Uh, that one there is from Albert Einstein. The important thing is to never stop questioning. And then in the middle, we've got uh, the Beatles. In fact, every single Beatle four, is yep. here, including John Lennon. And he says, we'll all shine on like the moon and the stars and the sun. And then up here at the top, um, actually right here on the far right, we've got mm -hmm. Amanda Gorman who just came to recent fame at the presidential inauguration. And she actually wrote this poem specifically for Lucy. And there's a great quote in here. She says, hope implores us, may ancient, um, the ancient study and the uncompromising core of us to keep rising for an earth more than worth fighting for. Her, Great she, words yeah, from a young poet. Yeah, she's, a, she's an amazing poet. Just blows me away. Uh, we are going to uh, now get a look at uh, some more of the messages uh, that we intend to leave behind for our descendants. Take a look. This is what I want to say to people, to beings, to consciousness who are so far away, I can't even imagine them. To represent our culture accurately, we should include hopelessness, risk-taking, the role of fortune, good or bad. To understand each desire has an edge, to know that we are responsible for the lives we change. No faith comes without cost, no one believes without dying. There are no curses, only mirrors held up to the souls of gods and mortals. Remember you are all people, and all people are you. Remember you are this universe, this universe is you. I would just like to say that this wonderful emissary to the Trojan asteroids is itself a message. Lucy speaks for all that is best about human ingenuity, 
curiosity and endeavor. Do you still have birds that wake you up in the morning with their singing and lovers who gaze at the stars, trying to read in them the fate of their love? If you do, we'll recognize them or not. And receive those, those words inscribed on a plaque from all of us, for all of us, filled with those those aspirations and that inspiration and that imagination that we need so much right now. A little noisy, but I'm so excited. Lucy is going back in the sky with diamonds. Johnny will love that. Anyway, if you meet anyone up there, Lucy, give them peace and love from me. All right, we've got that audio issue taken care of, so we're going to go over now to NASA Edge's Blair Allen, standing by with Bob Cabana. Blair? Thanks so much, Marie. Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties. You know, the, uh, the launch was so impressive, even our gear was affected. Uh, but, Bob, it's really impressive to see this launch this morning. Tell us, how is it from your perspective? Well, uh, first off, from my perspective, I, I got my very own NASA Edge microphone. I'm just elated. <laughs> now, Blair, you know... Anytime you see a rocket ship leave planet Earth, it is an experience. It's a feast for the senses, sight, sound, and feel. It's emotional. And having Lucy on board, I mean, this is the coolest <laughs> darn mission, going to the Trojan asteroids, looking back at the beginning of our universe five billion years ago, absolutely amazing. And that's kind of what's impressive. I mean, we're talking about this important science mission. But here at Kennedy, we've had 24 launches so far. What's going on? Well, I, I tell you, first off, I could not be more proud of our NASA team, our contractor civil service team that has persevered through this pandemic, not missing a beat, you know, making all our missions. I mean, we've launched humans to the International Space Station for the first time since the end of the shuttle program during it. We've launched Perseverance to Mars. You know, we're getting ready to launch James Webb here in uh, December. That's going to be amazing. And, and getting Lucy off on time. You know, we only, if we didn't get off in this launch window, we're talking another year before we launch. Yeah. And uh, that is impressive to see how things came together so perfectly. But tell us a little bit about what's coming down the pike. You, we've seen a lot of things happen <laughs> here at Kennedy and lots of things to look forward to. Well, absolutely. You know, I mean, first off, from a science mission point of view, uh, of course, next month we're going out to the West Coast for DART. Then yep. we're coming back here in December for ICSPE. Yep. In December, down in French Guiana, we're launching James Webb. What an amazing yeah. telescope that's going to be. A 21-foot mirror, you know, and then a solar shield, a sun shield the size of a tennis court. You know, they talk about the nine minutes of terror <laughs> landing on Mars. Right. We're talking four weeks of nail, <laughs> nail biting as that thing unfolds. But to look back 13 and a half billion years, almost to the beginning of our, our universe, you know, three and a half, 350 million years from the beginning, it's going to be amazing. And then over in the vehicle assembly building over yeah. there in High Bay 3, stacked up, is that awesome space launch system, that Boeing core stage with the Northrop Grumman solids and those four Aerojet <laughs> Rocketdyne RS-25s. Yeah. The Orion spacecraft rolls over here in, uh, on the 19th, stacked down on top. It's going out to the pad for a wet dress rehearsal, and then we're going to launch it to the moon. We're going to do that first test flight without crew in preparation for going back to the moon in a sustainable way so that we can go on to Mars. Just so much going on. I, I love it. Thank you so much for being on the show. From center director now to NASA <laughs> administrator, back to you, Marie. Great things here at NASA. All right, thank you, Blair. One of the asteroids Lucy will visit, Euripides, has already given researchers a recent surprise revealed by the Hubble Space Telescope. Take a look. On January 9th, 2020, NASA's Lucy mission team revealed that the spacecraft would be visiting not seven asteroids as planned, but eight. As it turns out, Euripides, one of the Trojan asteroids along Lucy's path, has a small satellite or moonlet orbiting it. Finding these tiny new worlds before Lucy is launched in 2021 means that the team can investigate their orbits and plan for more detailed follow-up observations during flybys. Dr. Keith Knoll and other Lucy Science team members have been using the Hubble Space Telescope to search for satellites and rings around Lucy's targets. This can be challenging since the raw images are often filled with bumps, blobs, and diffraction spikes. 
The Lucy team didn't see any evidence of a new satellite until November 2019. After experimenting with the brightness and contrast on the Hubble images, Dr. Knoll saw a peculiar faint spot near the much brighter Euripides. Dr. Mike Brown, another team member, noticed the spot showed up in a slightly different position on another set of Hubble images taken two days later. This change suggested that the spot was an orbiting satellite. The team went back to Hubble and got three more chances to make observations of the possible new satellite. On the first two tries, the little moonlet was nowhere to be found. But on the third observation, on January 3, 2020, they found the possible new satellite again. It was clearly visible next to Euripides, which was over 6,000 times brighter. This huge difference in brightness suggests that the satellite is less than one kilometer in diameter, very small compared to Euripides at 64 kilometers. With a few more Hubble observations, the team pinned down the new satellite's orbit, and they proposed a name. The International Astronomical Union approved, and from now on the little satellite will be known as Keta, after Enriqueta Basilio, the first woman to light the Olympic cauldron. Evidence indicates that the Trojan asteroid Euripides is the largest fragment from a massive asteroid collision that happened billions of years ago. It is possible that the new satellite Keta is a remnant of that catastrophic event, whether with Hubble or with the Lucy spacecraft's flyby. Each observation enriches our understanding about the Trojan asteroid's formation and Euripides' relationship with its newly discovered companion. The discovery of this new moonlet around the Trojan asteroid Euripides is just a preview of the incredible scientific knowledge that will be captured by the Lucy mission as it explores this area of our solar system. All right, our, no our next guest is uh, one of the great minds behind the mighty Atlas V, uh, which just had another spectacular launch here. He's standing by with uh, Franklin Fitzgerald from NASA Edge over at the ASOC. Franklin? Yeah, thanks, Marie. I'm here with Scott Messer, ULA Program Manager. Uh, Scott, how did the launch go from ULA, ULA's perspective? Well, uh, it was uh, near perfect so far. Uh, we, we never uh, claim success until we separate and get the spacecraft where it wants to be, but uh, so far the first stage was great. The countdown was very quiet, and uh, it's a beautiful launch so far. Great, great to hear. Um, this is a, a mission unlike any other before it. Can you tell us exactly how unique the trajectory was for the Atlas V on this mission? Yeah, so certainly the trajectory for the spacecraft is very unique, uh, probably never been done before. Uh, but from an Atlas uh, standpoint, we've launched uh, many planetary missions over the years, and uh, we just kind of did our standard thing in order to get the spacecraft ready to go. Um, you know, getting ready for this mission through COVID uh, was a challenge for, um, I know, many people. Uh, were there any challenges that you had to overcome? Is there any kind of anecdote that you can tell about this mission? Yeah, so uh, the team, it's been a very... Uh, aggressive week, a couple of weeks with us. You know, we launched Landsat uh, 9 just a few weeks ago, turned around uh, uh, the end of the week, so we launched on Monday, and we turned around and had uh, the wet dress rehearsal here for Lucy on Friday, and uh, then turned around and did our Vulcan uh, PTT test here. So it's been really a, a very exciting week for the team here, and the team has worked really hard through all the COVID stuff, through all of the activities, uh, in order to maintain the launch date. And here we are, right at the beginning of the window, and uh, a beautiful launch so far. Absolutely. Well, Scott, uh, we wish you the best of luck uh, over the next 12 years, and uh, thanks for joining us here on the show today. Uh, Marie, Daryl, back to you to learn more about science. All right, Scott and Franklin, thank you very much. As you look at the bottom of your screen, I want to remind you we have a progress bar, which is tracking where we're going. You can see that we had the main engine cut off. We're awaiting that second burn of the Centaur, and of course, we'll have all of that for you. But we have about an hour to go before signal acquisition from Lucy. Only then will the team be able to breathe a sigh of relief. So let's hear from some of the scientists about their passion for Lucy in their own words. Hi, my name is Danya Douglas Bradshaw, and I'm the project manager for the Lucy project, which will be the first mission to the Trojan asteroids. Building a spacecraft is quite exciting. I worked uh, many decades as a mechanical engineer, really focused on thermal and heat transfer. And so when you work in that capacity, you are supporting the development of spacecraft as well as instruments. Hi, my name is Dr. Carly Howitt, 
and I'm the instrument scientist at the MBIC camera on Lucy. I love working on Lucy for so many reasons, but one of them is being able to explore the universe from the comfort of my own office, so I don't have to don diving gear or, you know, go into these dangerous or hard situations. I get to enjoy the data as it comes back from the comfort of my office and explore the universe that way. My name is Corey Preichel, and I am the Mechanical Operations Lead for the Interplanetary Spacecraft, Lucy. My job is to plan and lead major mechanical operations, such as spacecraft transportations, spacecraft crane lifts, or testing of major spacecraft components, and ensure they go off without a hitch. My name is Mike Sakarik. I'm the Deputy Project System Engineer for Lucy. The thing I like the most about Project System Engineering is that you get to touch all aspects of the mission from the spacecraft, payload, launch vehicle, ground system, flight dynamics. Product system engineers have oversight of all of those different aspects of the mission. I'm Tiffany Kapler. I am a public outreach specialist with the Lucy mission. And one of the things that I love about my job is that it gives me an opportunity to use my creativity and share my enthusiasm for science with others while I get them excited about space exploration. Hi, I'm Rick Berry, and I am the Configuration Management Lead for the Lucy Mission and Goddard Space Flight Center. We're building spacecraft, we're building payloads and instruments at Goddard. We coordinate with our team members to ensure that the configuration management is correct by managing the changes and the requirements. Hello, my name is Elizabeth McCall, and I'm the Project Support Specialist for the Lucy Project. One of the more memorable experiences I've had was just in July of this year. I was able to fly with the spacecraft from Colorado to Florida on a C-17. My name is Vince Elliott, and I'm the Lucy Deputy Project Manager over Resources. I lead a team of 12, and they are exceptional at what they do. It also means I get to work with some of the brightest engineers and scientists the world has ever known, doing something that I love. Hi, my name is James Traley, and I'm a producer and animator at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And I created the video series you're currently watching right now. I'm so excited to see Lucy launch, and I can't wait to share the complex and exciting discoveries that we make out there at the Trojans to you, the public, through film and animation. Go NASA, go Lucy. This Lucy mission is dedicated to a number of team members at NASA and United Launch Alliance, some of them no longer with us today. There are three dedications placed on the side of the Atlas V rocket. The first says Lucy Strong, recognizing the team's hard work throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. There it is. Uh, we got a shot of it before liftoff. And the second is a memorial to ULA team members Mark Kaz Kazabowski and William Billy Joyner. Mark was an accomplished engineer and respected mentor. During his 30-year career, he focused on launch vehicle structures and integration. He led the structural design of the Atlas II, II AS, and III development programs. Mark was also a family man, reminding his team always to take care of themselves and their families. Billy spent much of his 35-year career at Lockheed Martin and ULA. He was an accomplished technician who supported critical payload processing for the Department of Defense and NASA. Billy was known for his diligence and dependability, contributing to the successful launch of many historic missions. He was a great friend and teammate to many. And finally, a dedication in memory of Craig M. Whitaker. His 40-year career began as a student with the Navy. You can see his name there also on the rocket. That led him to NASA, where he was a founding member of NASA's Launch Services Program in 1998. Craig was instrumental in developing and managing the program's launch service contracts over many years. The final highlight of Craig's career was the award of the Atlas V rocket for the Lucy mission. Craig was a devoted family man, a respected leader, and a humble public servant. And we are here with his son. Craig Whitaker's son, Jared Whitaker, vehicle systems engineer, who also works just like his father did for NASA's launch services program. Jared, great to have you here. I appreciate it. Glad to be here. How was the launch? How was the experience being up there and watching this rocket, which has been dedicated to your father? 
Uh, it was really, um, really great. I mean, I usually work on the, the missions and things, and so sitting on console, so um, it's, it was really great to be able to see it from this vantage point out here at OSB2. Fantastic, fantastic view from up there, and night launches are always spectacular, and so just really, uh, really, really enjoyed it. What did LSP mean to your father, the launch services program, and then you following in his footsteps? Yeah, so like... Um, LSP, I think he, he really embodied a lot of the things that LSP stands for, like a, a good family man, as, as, as uh, we said, um, really dedicated to, to the work, dedicated to his family, and um, always curious, always learning, learning new about science missions and things like that, um, really, really meant a lot to him, so I mm -hmm. think he, he, he definitely enjoyed his 20 plus years with uh, LSP and his, all his time with NASA, for sure. And Jared, we know your dad was one of the founding members of LSP from its earliest days in the 90s, and now you work for the program yourself. Yeah. i got to ask, did his influence kind of steer you in that direction? Oh, yeah, I would say absolutely. Um, yeah, in 1998, I was, I was only seven years old, and so every uh, afternoon, pick me up from school or whatnot, go home, and at, over, over dinner, we have conversations about what the, the last uh, science mission was, what, what was coming up with LSP, and so he always encouraged me to, to do whatever I wanted, but I definitely in, enjoyed um, going into engineering. Um, and I ended up coming to LSP. I think in my heart, I always knew I was gonna, I was always gonna <laughs> yeah. end up with LSP, and I'm, uh, I'm very glad I did. And so, enjoyed the the couple of years we got to work together and and share uh, more from the business side from him and more from the engineering side from me. It was a nice uh, give and take. So, really enjoyed our time for sure. Yeah, and glad you got to actually enjoy it as a spectator for a change yeah. instead of uh, working. It was very uh, relaxing. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. And there was some overlap between you and your father at uh, LSP. Yeah, so I finished my master's um, in mechanical engineering in 2015, and so we worked together almost five years. So it was really nice, like, in the, on some afternoons, like, later in the week, he'd come by. We, we were, we're not morning people, so we'd come by in the <laughs> afternoon and chit-chat about how things were going and, and what our plans for the weekend were. So it was nice to just pass by him and, and kind of talk a little bit of, a little bit of work, a little bit of personal stuff at the end of the day, and it was, it was really enjoyable to, yeah, to well, be able to deal with him. That's awesome. Yeah. As a, as a non-morning person myself, I used to be. I appreciate you getting up <laughs> yeah. early with us. <laughs> it was well worth it. Well worth it. Thank you so much, Jared. Thank you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here. All right. Learning what an asteroid is made of without coming into contact with it takes the right scientific instruments. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, let's check in with Megan Cruz on top of OSB2 with another program scientist. Megan. Hey there, Daryl. Yeah, now I have Tom Statler. Tom, what did you think of the launch today? Oh, it was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. I just couldn't have, couldn't have hoped for a more spectacular launch. Yeah, and uh, you know, you're the program scientist on this mission. Can you talk to us about what that role entails? Uh, sure. I mean, all of our missions have program scientists at headquarters. We're the main science advocate for the mission, and we also work with the mission teams kind of as coaches to make sure that mm. the science ambitions that they have for the mission fit with NASA processes. Gotcha. And we saw Lucy lift off about 30 minutes ago. Can you talk to us about how her three main instruments are going to work together to study the Trojans? Sure. So Lucy has three main instruments. There's the LORI, which is a high-resolution black and white camera, LORALF, that is a spectroscopic camera, and LATES, that is a thermal imager, like a, a no-touch thermometer. And so we'll be able to get detailed images of the landforms, the craters, cliffs, wow. landslides, anything else that's been going on on the surfaces. Uh, LORALF will be able to tell us about composition, so we'll get an into indication of the mineralogy, the chemical composition, and uh, Latesse will tell us from the temperature readings, uh, what's the texture of the surface? Is it rocky? Is it uh, sandy? Is it gravelly? They all work together to tell us what, what's going on on these asteroids. Wow, without even landing on them, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And we know that Lucy was named after the Lucy mm -hmm. fossil. The Lucy fossil was named after the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And actually, Lucy actually has a diamond on board. Can you talk to us about that? It does. So uh, the Latesse instrument, that touchless thermometer mm -hmm. is, uh, is an interferometer, and people who are in the instrumentation know what that means, but w in an interferometer you need to divide the incoming light into two paths, and so you need a device, an optical device called a beam splitter, and one of the best ways to make a beam splitter is to make it out of synthetic diamond. So mm -hmm. there is a synthetic diamond, not a natural diamond, it's a pretty big one, I understand it's about 20 carats, which wow. would make a big Could piece make a of big jewelry, diamond right but yeah. it's, a, it's a industrial <laughs> piece of uh, piece of, of, of synthetic diamond that's really essential for getting these temperature readings on the surfaces of the Trojan asteroids. Awesome. And you're also the program scientist for DART that's scheduled to launch uh, next month. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a, about that experiment? I can. Well, DART, DART, like Lucy, is going to an asteroid, and that's where the similarity ends. Mm, okay. Because DART... 
uh, Lucy, of course, is going to the Trojan asteroids in the outer solar system, and DART is going to a near-Earth asteroid, not so much with the intent of studying it, but to demonstrate that we have the technological ability to be able to deflect an asteroid mm. if we're ever in a situation where there's an asteroid on collision course with Earth. There is not one right. now. No, no, no known asteroid is on a collision course with Earth, and the asteroid that we're going to collide with deliberately with the DART spacecraft is not a danger to Earth, and there's nothing that we can do to make it a danger to the Earth. But we're going to test our ability to uh, target an asteroid to execute a kinetic impact, that is, run a spacecraft into it, and then we're going to test the asteroid's response to that impact, how much do we move it by and how effective that will be to protect Earth in the future. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a movie. Strange, huh? <laughs> <laughs> No, maybe not uh, Not with uh, as dramatic a sound, uh, a script as some of the past movies, but it'll be a very exciting uh, when we execute the kinetic impact and then get the data from ground-based telescopes afterwards that tells us what we actually accomplished. Great, Tom. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Thank Marie, you. back to you. All right, thank you, Megan. If you're just joining us, we had a spectacular launch this morning in Florida. NASA's Lucy launched into the sky with a diamond, a pretty big one, it sounds <laughs> like, uh, about 36 minutes ago. And the spacecraft lifted off on a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. That was at 5.34 a.m. Eastern Time. And in just a little bit, we expect to hear confirmation of spacecraft separation. And there's a replay of the launch from this morning. A beautiful shot there as you see the Atlas V launching away from Space Launch Complex 41 here at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. It was a beautiful launch, and every launch is always a little different, right? We had mm -hmm. some clouds up high, and it yeah. went behind them, and then popped back out. Yeah. I, I love that. I love, I love when it illuminates the clouds, because you don't, I mean, it's, it's pitch dark behind us now, and so you don't even know they're there, and the rocket just lights up the entire sky, and it's stunning. It's like a sunrise. Wonderful. All right, the Lucy spacecraft, named after the early human fossil and the famous Beatles song, is just beginning a 12-year mission to uncover the mysteries of our outer solar system. Lucy shows us more. Lucy's long journey to space begins today, but her story actually started years ago. It took a team of scientists and engineers many years to plan where Lucy would go and what she would have to do. Then, Lucy's engineers had to build her out of individual parts and put her together like a puzzle. Lucy had to go through tough physical tests to prove she was mission ready. How are you holding up, Lucy? These are the vibration and acoustic tests to make sure that Lucy won't lose any screws during the shaky launch on a rocket. Lucy wasn't quite ready just yet. The engineers still had to be sure that she was prepared for the harsh environment of space. They chilled Lucy to freezing temperatures, then warmed her up to scalding hot temperatures in the thermal vacuum test. Sure, those tests weren't easy, but they prepared Lucy for the long adventure ahead. One, zero, and and lift off. We're glad you can join Lucy on her adventure to explore the Trojan asteroids. Now, let's get the journey started. I'm really starting to love that cartoon Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> She's great. <laughs> really cute. Thank you, Lucy. Let's send it over now to Megan. She is with the paleoanthropologist who discovered the Lucy fossil in 1974. Megan. Yeah, Daryl, what an honor to have Donald Johansson here with me today. Good morning to you. Good morning to you. You know, you have to take me back to that day when you discovered Lucy in Ethiopia back in 1974. Tell me how you found her. Well, it's amazing. It'll be 50 years since that discovery, wow. two years from now. I was a young anthropologist. I was searching in the extreme northeast of Ethiopia for looking for remains of our human ancestors. I glanced over my shoulder one day. I saw a little piece of bone, recognized it as belonging to a human skeleton, wow. and that led to Lucy. And Lucy has become the benchmark by which all discoveries are judged. 
That's amazing. Just to see over the shoulder, like how did you pick the small piece of bone out from from all around you? Well, you know, you, when you're out there, you train your eye. And you know how we always say you look, what, you find something in the last place you look? Well, <laughs> that's sort of like what happened. Oh, I, my God. I carry these images in my mind of bones and teeth and so on. And when I saw that elbow, piece of elbow, I knew it couldn't be from a baboon. It couldn't be from an antelope. And from all the work I had done in graduate school, I knew that it had to come from a human ancestor. And why did you name her after the Beatles song? Well, I thought it was a female because of the very small size of the bones. And okay. we thought, well, is this a child? No, the third molars were erupted, the wisdom teeth, as we call them today. And that night in camp, in the middle of nowhere, when we were celebrating her discovery, someone was, we were listening to a Beatles tape, uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamond was playing and someone said why don't you just call her Lucy and that was it you could not go back and call her anything else no, that I became that her name. name yeah and now I you just told me that this was your first launch and it gave you goosebumps that's so wonderful I mean how was it to know that there's a spacecraft on there that's named after the fossil you discovered well I, I will never look at Jupiter the same uh, Jupiter was always interesting to me as a kid. I had my little telescope. I watched the moons go around Jupiter. And to be out here this morning was absolutely mind-expanding. And it was a, such a positive experience. You know, the world is going through some tribulations. Something as positive as like this, as positive as, as this is, people should look at yeah. and see what the creativity of the human mind can do. Yeah, and there it is. You. She's on her way. Yeah, I'm and so glad you And she will tell us so much. Yes, and awesome. I, I, I just had goosebumps. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Why don't we send it back over to Joshua and Mick for another update on Lucy. Hey, thanks so much, uh, Megan. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't quite fly over Ethiopia. We did fly over part of southern Africa uh, on our way there, and we're in the middle now of the second burn of the Centaur. Mick, talk to us about uh, what the second burn is. So main engine start did occur uh, just a few minutes ago, and this will get uh, Centaur and Lucy into its transfer orbit, leaving the park orbit around Earth heading into that orbit, heading uh, to get Lucy on her way to the Trojan asteroids. So very important burn. This will last about six minutes uh, and to get her the velocity and everything she needs to go to get on her way to, uh, to to the Trojan asteroids. There you go. So just under about four minutes left in this burn. Uh, so going back today, uh, we did kick off at 534 on the button uh, and got a report. Um, storage pressures are stable during the burn. Uh, from storage bottle pressures look good from the ULA commentator Rob Kesselman. Uh, ULA always expecting excellence, but he reported that it, the booster performed better than expected. Uh, I'm not sure what's better than excellent, but they got it today. <laughs> yeah, it just means we had some uh, great performance from the first stage booster in the RD-180, uh, putting Centaur into the proper order uh, and that injection that they needed uh, for, for getting Lucy on her way. And now that we're into main engine start two, uh, that just means we have a, a more precise uh, uh, trajectory and everything's looking good. The spacecraft customer and ULA and launch services provider pro uh, program are very happy at this point. Yeah, so uh, Lucy, after this burn is completed, uh, we'll then wait a, a few more minutes before we get into uh, separation from the Centaur. And at that point, Lucy will be set up for her first orbit, her first major orbit of Earth, uh, which will be just, just under one year. Uh, to complete and then have the, er the first Earth gravity assist flyby where Lucy will get close enough to Earth where uh, she'll literally just be, sl it'll, it's like kind of like a slingshot effect where she will just pick up speed flying past Earth to start getting out towards where the, uh, the asteroid belt and the Trojan asteroids are. Yeah, first of three gravity first of three, assists, that's right. so it'll, it'll be a, a big move for her. That's right, and so uh, kind of, uh, again, thinking about the complexity of this, it's a little bit shocking to think about the first asteroid uh, won't be explored, won't be passed by for another four years. Uh, and then beyond that, there's another gravity assist later on down the ride after a few uh, Trojan asteroids being explored. Yeah, 12-year mission. Uh, very excited about this. We just started this this morning, right? And uh, the team did a great job, to, uh, you know, developing this trajectory and making sure that we could get out to those Lagrange points that needed where those asteroids well, are. Is it Lagrange or Lagrange? It's because Lagrange. I think depending upon what part of America <laughs> or the part of the world you're from, it could be a different different uh, pronunciation. Uh, you there. know, Daryl reminds me all the time it's Lagrange, but if you're from the south, it's probably something else. I don't know. But Lagrange points <laughs> where the uh, where the Trojan asteroids are in L4 
four now five um, and you know that's that's a very important I mean this team did an excellent job in this trajectory design and Centaur is on target to deliver Lucy on that uh, that path yeah so the Lagrange points a uh, little explanation there so for every pair of planetary bodies that are interacting that are kind of engaged uh, there are five Lagrange points uh, and those five Lagrange points are in very consistent places uh, and what that means is that a lot of people have this uh, notion that if you're in low Earth orbit, the space station for instance, that you are in zero gravity. This is actually a misconception. Well, you're in what we call microgravity. microgravity yeah. Yes. Uh, and so as you're uh, in orbit, you're essentially falling around the Earth. Uh, and so gravity is still about 98% of what it is right here now. Uh, and so when you're at a Lagrange point, there's actually a balance of gravitational forces where you're able to essentially sit there in what really is a, a zero gravity. Uh, that's probably a more appropriate place to describe zero gravity. Uh, again, you mentioned Lagrange points four and five. Uh, that's where these two groups of Trojan asteroids hang out. Uh, and these are actually nowhere near Jupiter. Uh, so they're Jupiter's they're Jupiter's, sorry, we're getting calls here. Uh, good performance here on the Centaur still as they're about to wrap up this, uh, this second burn. Again, uh, preparing for space drive separation. Second, Miko 2. And we have Miko 2. That's a good sign right there. Main engine cutoff two. That means uh, Centaur has done its job, performed, Centaur and uh, will be uh, coasting for just a few minutes as we get ready for spacecraft separation. And Centaur makes sure she's pointing in the right direction. That's right. Uh, and so, uh, just finishing that thought, the Lagrange points four and five are roughly equidistant uh, from the the Sun and Jupiter, making isosceles or equilateral triangles. Uh, if you if you're ready for your math at 6 a.m. <laughs> Uh, or whatever time it is right now, uh, we're, we're watching our, our, our mission clock here. Uh, and so uh, essentially they're the same distance from Jupiter as Jupiter is from the Sun, uh, which is roughly 465 million miles. So these points are very far from Jupiter, very far from the Sun, uh, but pretty exciting. And, and Mick, uh, LSP, no stranger to exploring the solar system, no stranger to mission success with science missions. Yeah, you know, we are very happy to be working with United Launch Alliance, our commercial partner today with this Atlas 5401. Uh, you know, this mission started seven years ago for some of these folks, uh, some longer. And as uh, the Atlas 5401 was selected for this mission, LSP took all those requirements from our spacecraft customer. And uh, we looked at those and we decided what needed to be done and we selected the Atlas 5 for this mission. Our uh, in team of engineers, scientists and analysts uh, worked very closely with the spacecraft customer and United Launch Alliance. And uh, as a result, we had a successful liftoff at 5.34 a.m. today, the very beginning of our window and the beginning of our science period. Uh, so very happy so far. Uh, still waiting for that spacecraft separation and making sure the spacecraft healthy, healthy. But uh, so far, everything has been going just as we had predicted. Yeah, very good. Uh, a reminder coming up ahead, we have spacecraft separation. Uh, as you see there, a countdown to when we're expecting to see that happen. Uh, what you're seeing on screen is a graphical representation based on real telemetry data. So we believe this is, we are confident this is what's happening in space right now. That's not actually a live Co video. Not stabilized at the coast attitude. Uh, and so again, there you see on your, on your time, we're expecting that spacecraft separation in about nine minutes from now. So. Uh, after that, uh, we will have uh, a brief period where we'll, be, we'll, we'll wait to start solar array deploy. Uh, then we'll have, uh, that takes about 20 minutes to deploy the solar arrays, big beautiful solar arrays. And then we will, once those are up and powered, we would expect a couple minutes later to be able to get that acquisition yep. signal. That's a very scary time for the spacecraft yeah. team. They'll be waiting for that for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right, I think we are ready now to send you uh, upstairs uh, to NASA Edges Franklin with the Lucy Program Manager. Thanks, guys. Yes, I'm here with uh, Donya Douglas Bradshaw, who is the Lucy Project Manager. Donya, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing awesome. Great. Um, how do you prepare for a mission like Lucy when nothing quite like this has been done before? Well, it certainly takes a team of engineers, uh, scientists, uh, everyone. Uh, you know, Dr. Hal Levinson, who is the Lucy PI, has a vision and it takes a team of hundreds to bring that vision to fruition. How long have you uh, been working on this project? So I joined Lucy about three years ago. Uh, joined the team as the deputy project manager and then about two years ago um, became the project manager. Now 
Do you have any, like, exciting stories to tell about this mission? Because, you know, you all had to work through COVID to get this thing up and running. Yeah, it, uh, you know, COVID happened in March 2020 unexpectedly, and um, there was a lot of uncertainty around that. And, um, but this team um, and this spacecraft development led by Lockheed Martin um, quickly, rapidly, without missing a beat, put together a plan to enable us to um, re-engineer the, the integration and test program. I know with, within like the last two years, the uh, components for the spacecraft were uh, you know, compiled, but it wasn't even put together. How did you get that all up and running basically in a little over a year? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the plan, you're right. When, when the pandemic happened, we were about six, five or six months away from the start of our spacecraft integration and test program. Um, and so there was a lot of uncertainty, uh, but the team, the entire team came together and really devised a way to uh, keep people safe, do social distancing, social distancing, adding the capability for folks to monitor uh, the integration and testing remotely, um, using collaboration tools, online tools, um, just different techniques that were available to us. And so we were able to do that. Certainly there were some inefficiencies, um, but we were able to compress our schedule so that we could stick to this launch date. Great. Donya, thanks for joining us this morning uh, and continued success. Thank you very much. All My right, Daryl, back to you. All right, Franklin and Donya, thank you so much. Earlier you heard uh, a little bit about the Lagrange points. I got a primer from Mick and Joshua, and so now let's revisit that. Lagrange points are uh, two gravitationally protected zones that are around the orbit of Jupiter. Here's principal investigator Hal Levison and Lucy to help explain. The Trojan asteroids are found in Lagrange points, which are these special places that lead or follow planet in its orbit by 60 degrees, and it's sort of where the gravitational force of the planet and the gravitational force of the sun all cancel out. So if you put an object there, it will stay there for a long period of time, basically forever. So when we see objects there, these are objects that we know were in place a very long time ago. So if you just take a random asteroid and just put it in the outer solar system, the gravitational force of the four giant planets will just clear them out in a very short period of time. So they'll basically be gone. So the only places, it turns out, in the outer solar system where you can find stable regions are these Lagrange points. Lucy in particular is going to go after the Jupiter Trojans. We're trying to see a type of object that represents and constrains the formation of the outer planets and you need to go to these Lagrange points in order to see that kind of object. One of the really groovy aspects of our mission is its trajectory because we're visiting a record number of objects like these Trojans. And we do that with this very complicated dance, particularly in the beginning, where we are using the Earth, actually, as a gravitational slingshot. So Lucy will start off in an orbit very similar to the Earth. And then gravitational encounters with the Earth will actually pump it up so it gets out to the Lagrange points near Jupiter's orbit. So if you're going to understand how planets like the Earth formed, you have to understand how the bigger planets, which sort of dominated the whole process, came to be. And that's what Lucy is going to do. Well, that was Hal on tape. Let's join Hal live now, who is with Blair from NASA EDGE. Guys, take it away. Thanks so much, Daryl. Uh, Hal, obviously an incredible launch. You've been very involved and very important to the Lucy mention, but tell us about the experience of being on console and seeing the launch this morning. It was one of the most exciting experiences of my life. It was uh, truly awesome in the old-fashioned uh, meaning of that word, right? Well, I mean, you've carried this mission for so long, so seeing this happen, what a great moment, not just for you, but for the whole team. Well, it's been a team effort, there's no doubt. Tanya talked a lot about how 
it took a really village to build this spacecraft, right, and uh, under some very difficult um, conditions. So, um, um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's an emotional moment. I mean, this uh, is a big it, deal. It is, and yeah. it's been a, the last 24 hours has just been a roller coaster of excitement and build up, and everything was a success. Tell us a little bit about your history with, with Lucy. How did it all start for you? Oh, we started this project back in 2014. I think the first email that I have that had the word Lucy in the subject was in March of that year. And we've been working and competing against other missions since then. It's been a, a haul. And, you know, <laughs> the amazing thing about doing something like this is that it was all paper and PowerPoint <laughs> until about a year and a half ago. And then the folks at Lockheed took these concepts and built a spacecraft. And you know what's amazing, too, is you had a very interesting window. You really needed to launch today, or you'd have to wait a long time before you could try again. Well, we have a spectacular trajectory. I think you've been talking about that all day. We're going um, past an amazing collection of objects. And um, we have one chance really to do this, uh, the planets are literally aligning in order to make uh, this trajectory happening happen. So we either launch today or a year from now we do an EGA, an Earth Gravity Assist. We could launch directly at that time too. So we have two chances. And luckily we got it off and it's, it's going. And you were able to actually, you were on console, but you came up and actually saw the launch personally. I was not going to miss that, right? It's like uh, witnessing a birth of a child, right? That <laughs> you just really had to see it. And now you watch the child being raised. That's right. Right. I mean, the the, the analogy of uh, pregnancy and then a birth and then raising a child is really good for what we've been going through here. Great metaphor. Thanks so much, Hal. We really are excited for you and the Lucy mission. Back to you guys. Go Lucy. Hey, yeah, uh, go Lucy. Indeed, uh, we are standing by. Double check. In just 30 seconds, we are continuing to hear those calls that we are and on track. Back on at 20 percent. So obviously a big moment, especially for the for the ULA team. This would be the end of their their time. Centaur is now spinning up in anticipation of spacecraft separation. 15 seconds. Huge moment here for all the teams. Actually, a successful launch. Five this seconds. is what it's all about. Spacecraft set. We have indication of successful separation of the Lucy spacecraft. So we're hearing some clapping here in the in the MDC here at the ASOC, uh, Joshua, uh, and that is a that is a huge moment for all of the teams. Uh, we still have quite a bit to go. Uh, solar array deployment. We talked about those earlier. Those big, huge solar arrays that are needed, and uh, the team spacecraft team will be awaiting. Uh, to to get confirmation that that is started, and then there'll be 22 minutes. What they refer to as 22 minutes of terror, yeah. <laughs> um, waiting for those solar arrays to deploy. And of course, they have to get acquisition of signal to verify all that uh, slightly after that. So the next uh, few minutes, as we get through this, is going to be uh, spacecraft team will be uh, kind of sitting around waiting to see what happens and making sure Lucy is uh, healthy and doing well. But spacecraft separation huge milestone for the teams working the launch vehicle today. Yeah, I mean, Mick, I mean, even here, uh, I got some goosebumps. Like, the <laughs> it's chills in that moment of just, like, you can feel the energy of the people around you just, like, so excited. And, obviously, uh, that applause is very genuine. Uh, this, is a har this is a serious moment, but it's also, like, a really joyous moment. Um, and you'll see uh, the ULA team, obviously, this is the end of their major task for today. Uh, but NASA launch manager and the, the NASA LSP team, they will continue to stay with this because uh, for you guys, getting the spacecraft healthy is the mission. It's not just the launch. It's making sure that they get on their way successfully. That's uh, correct. We, w we want to deliver mission success, as Dr. Z <laughs> talked about earlier in the show, right? One of the things we want here at NASA is mission success, and that's all the way through making sure our spacecraft customer knows what's going on with their spacecraft and, and everything is well. So we'll be standing around waiting for solar array deployment. Uh, that'll begin uh, here about four minutes after the, uh, uh, you know, about an hour and four minutes after launch, uh, about six minutes from now and uh, we'll, uh, we'll go from there.
Yeah, so again, it's going to be a process that will start at roughly L plus 10430, uh, and then from there uh, we will wait uh, about 22 minutes is the expected time to complete solar array deploy. Those 24-foot diameter beautiful solar arrays, yeah. uh, taking up most of the size, the, the, the physical length of the, the spacecraft, uh, and then we will actually get confirmation of that for a couple more minutes uh, because those are designed to power the spacecraft uh, all the way through its mission and so there will be uh, a couple minutes where the the communication is being established between the spacecraft and the ground uh, not a simple process we'll talk that in a few more minutes uh, once we get closer to to that uh, acquisition of signal moment milestone uh, we'll kind of talk through how we're doing in interaction I think, uh, and then I know there's a chance we could potentially pick up uh, the actual live video. Uh, it wouldn't be live at the moment, the actual video from spacecraft separation. If we do catch that, we'll bring you that. Um, yeah, ULA recorded that on yep. board, and as they get closer to their uh, download point, they'll be able to download that. I don't know if we'll get that right away or not, but it was recorded, and eventually that will be uh, shared with the spacecraft customer. Uh, another unique thing, you were talk we were talking about those uh, solar arrays, why it's so important is uh, I heard earlier today that, you know, those things generate about 5,000 watts. That's all that the spacecraft uses. Man, that's not even enough to run a microwave here, <laughs> right? So that, that just shows you how efficient the spacecraft is. Yeah, very good. Uh, getting a few views there from around the country. We had one from ULA uh, headquarters in uh, Colorado, that there in Hangar AE with where some spacecraft folks. Uh, but for now, Daryl, we're going to send it back to you. I'm sorry, to Marie. All right, thank you, Joshua. Time to catch back up with our Lucy cartoon character. And in this next episode, Lucy wants to show you where she's going and why she's studying the Trojan asteroids. You might be wondering, where is Lucy off to? Ah, yes, the Trojan asteroids. These are a population of asteroids in orbit around the sun, about as far away as Jupiter. It may seem far away to you, but our Lucy spacecraft is a capable explorer and ready to make the trek to her targets. Lucy is aiming to visit asteroids in both of these Trojan swarms on her 12-year mission. The pull of gravity from the Sun balances the pull from Jupiter to keep the Trojan asteroids in these two groups. Due to the gravitational balancing act, these asteroids have been in these orbits for billions of years. It's still quite the challenge to explore these targets. However, our intrepid explorer is ready for her mission. Aren't you, Lucy? Ah, of course. You'll be the first spacecraft to visit these asteroids. I can't help but wonder, though. Why choose these asteroids in particular? I see. The scientific evidence says the Trojan asteroids are leftover material from the formation of the planets. Right. These asteroids hold vital clues to understanding the history of our solar system. It's just like a treasure hunt. What you discover could teach us about the history of the solar system and how the planets, including Earth, came to be the way they are. I won't hold you up any longer. Safe travels on your journey. Be sure to write home and tell us all about it. Welcome back out here to the broadcast area, and now we'd like to introduce you to a special guest, Audrey Martin. She's a graduate student at Northern Arizona University and played a role in today's launch. Audrey, you're a student, and you were involved with the Lucy Science Team. How That's unique right. is that? It's incredibly unique. I feel very, very privileged to um, have been able to work with the science team and also be here for the launch it's it's absolutely amazing what specifically did you work on i have been working with the science team so i do surface composition um, spectral analysis stuff and i've been working with the surface composition working group to really understand everything that we can understand now about the surface of Trojan asteroids so that when we get there, we can learn even more and we can be really prepared for what we're going to see and what we're going to discover. That's You've seen fantastic. the successful launch. We all watched it here. That was yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. We just saw successful spacecraft separation. Mm -hmm. But now we're entering that, that tense moment where Lucy's unfurling those gigantic yeah. solar arrays. Mm -hmm. well, what's that like for you right now? I mean, I'm um, very optimistic. 
so far everything that has gotten in the way of Lucy and the success of the mission. Um, everyone has come together in a very collaborative way to overcome that. And so I'm, I'm Feel very like optimistic. Destiny, huh? yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very optimistic. And I think, I think it'll go really well. Mm -hmm. And it will. <laughs> and, and if, other students, it. Uh, if other students want to do something similar, how, how do other students team up with NASA like you did? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's this program that the Lucy Mission has um, put together um, with Arizona State University. It's called La Space. L apostrophe space. How fitting. Yeah, it's Perfect. super cute. Um, <laughs> and it's for undergraduate students who are interested in working with NASA and working um, as a team and understanding or working on, you know, uh, designing missions and stuff like that. Um, that is really exciting and it's new. It's something that I didn't get to experience in undergrad and I would have absolutely loved it. Um, so if anyone out there is interested in it, you should definitely look up um, the little space program. All right. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thank Thanks for being here. Thanks. All right. Very good. And as you look at the bottom of the screen there, you can keep track as we are watching Solar Array deploy. You can see the timer is at 20 minutes and counting down. And we, of course, are monitoring the spacecraft team to find out the latest. Now, let's get back to that cartoon Lucy, right? Yes. She's kind of a hit. Yes. And in the next episode, uh, we hear from Lucy's flight navigator who discusses how the team directs Lucy on its journey to the Trojan asteroids. So to steer a spacecraft from millions of miles away, we have to first track its trajectory. So we have to determine where in the solar system the spacecraft is, predict where it's heading, and compare that to where we want it to go. So the navigation team ensures Lucy's on the right trajectory by tracking Lucy's position and velocity in the solar system, predicting where it's headed, and adjusting its course so that it aces the flyby. So once Lucy starts approaching one of its asteroid targets, the navigation team utilizes the instruments, the cameras on board to take pictures of the asteroid and background stars, and that helps us hone in on targeting that close flyby. So commands travel at the speed of light, and over the course of Lucy's trajectory, its position from Earth is varying substantially. When Lucy is near Earth during our Earth gravity assists, it takes a mere seconds for the data or commands to be received by the spacecraft and for the spacecraft to send data back to us. But at the farthest extent of Lucy's trajectory and the farthest distance from Earth, it can take up to an hour for our commands to be received traveling at the speed of light. It's not only the data encoded in the signals, but it's the properties of the signals itself. We know what time the spacecraft sent the data and we know what time it was received on Earth. So we can calculate how long it took the signal to travel at the speed of light, and that gives us information about how far Lucy is from Earth. And then we also can get velocity information because the spacecraft is moving away from the Earth as it's sending those signals, and so there's a change in the frequency of the radio signal, and that gives us information about velocity. So like all NASA missions, Lucy is designed to be robust to anomalies or surprises. Uh, but in the event that something unexpected happens, there's either a contingency plan on the shelf or a group of relevant mission experts are uh, brought in to come up with the best solution to solve the problem. A little less than six years from now, Lucy will fly by the first Trojan asteroids in the mission, Euripides and its small moon, Keta. This next episode of the Lucy cartoon series shows us an illustration. There it is, Lucy. Your first Trojan asteroids. Euripides with its small moon, Keta. Earth to Lucy! Remember, you need to take a lot of images of Euripides and Keta in not a lot of time before you're zooming off to your next target. Make sure you get all those images for us. It's beautiful, isn't it?
And we're past. Whew. That was quick, right? Did I get any good data? That's great to hear. Can't wait to see them. Just send them back to us here at Earth. We have so much to learn from what you've already sent back to us. And you're just getting started out there. So remember, it will take Lucy 12 years to visit all eight asteroids on her journey, and the next group of Trojan asteroids Lucy will visit each has its own unique characteristics and lessons to reveal. There are still five more Trojan asteroids to explore on your 12-year journey. Each one has a different story to tell about the history of our solar system. Next up is Polymely, a mere 21 kilometers or 13 miles in diameter. Afterwards, you'll be zooming by Lucas, which rotates at an extremely slow rate, with each day being about 18.5 Earth days long. Afterwards, you'll be on to Oris, which might be rich in organics and carbon. Lastly, you'll be on your way to a twin pair of asteroids, Patroclus and Menetius. These asteroids, relatively unchanged over 4 billion years, will give us a glimpse of our solar system's distant past. With each flyby of a Trojan asteroid, you'll be looking at time capsules from the birth of our solar system over 4 billion years ago. Lucy, what your observations tell us about the composition and properties of the Trojan asteroids could give us clues about how Earth came to be. Absolutely. Carry on your journey, Lucy. And don't forget to call and show us what you find out there. We'll be waiting. Good luck. Thank you, Lucy. The Trojan asteroids have been called ancient time capsules. So you know what? We've got a challenge for you to create your own time capsule to open when Lucy completes the mission in 12 years. Here's how you can get involved. March 2nd, 2033. Where will you be? The Lucy spacecraft will be right here. But what about you? Over the next 12 years, NASA's Lucy mission will explore more asteroids than any previous mission, flying by one main belt asteroid and seven Trojan asteroids. These ancient time capsules will allow us to trace the origins of our solar system. We invite you to accompany Lucy on its 12-year journey by creating your own time capsule. Set aside a box of mementos, create a digital file, or simply write a letter to yourself. Get creative. We encourage you to post a photo, drawing, video, or other description on social media using the hashtag LucyTimeCapsule. At each major mission milestone, we'll remind you to revisit and add to your time capsule. Consider, what would you tell your future self? In what ways will you grow? How do you want to mark this current moment in your life? Lucy carries her own time capsule into space, a plaque with words of wisdom for her descendants who may one day come across the spacecraft long after its primary mission ends. The messages encourage hope and humility, knowledge and curiosity, appreciation of humanity, and exploration of the cosmos. We hope you'll join us, and Lucy, as we look with anticipation upon the unknown of our future, both as individuals and as humankind. And remember to use the hashtag LucyTimeCapsule when you are sharing your videos and photos on social media. And we can't wait to see what you come up with and what Marie comes up with. Look <laughs> so here. I, I heard about this project and I got so excited. So I came prepared with my own you little time capsule did. items. I have a picture of my kids. Aww. They're both under six. So they're going to look so much different when Lucy gets done in 12 they years. They might that. not like me as much then either. But the box is well, pink. So we got to remember this moment. I've got the, one of their favorite toys, a unicorn. Aww. Some uh, some patches from missions this year. The Crew 2 one they That's launched earlier touch. this year. And yeah. a, the Lucy mission patch, of course. Good. A pair of my kids' shoes because I'm oh. sentimental, a mask, What's this? because it's a face mask. Oh, I mean, that's it will we'll remember the times. And my first plane tickets from my first post-quarantine trip on an how airplane. About so, that? How about you, Daryl? What do you have? <laughs> well, I don't have all that, but you know what? <laughs> I wore some socks that are my planetary socks. <laughs> you wore socks. socks? You see that? I mean, we don't I, want to well, show the audience I, are that. You, you're gonna, I'm he's gonna, taking off I'm his socks. I'm going to take off 
But this is great, because you know why? <laughs> that's Jupiter on my sock, right? All right, well. And so on the other side, what's that, Marie? I don't know, maybe some asteroids? It looks like Euripides, maybe? You know, Great. but you know what? I was going to share this with you, but you just took that off your foot so you can get your own time capsule box. <laughs> I, so I, I can't put it in the little girl's shoe? My, you can put it in my baby shoe, okay. sure, yeah. Great. All right, and we have first light right behind us. You can start to see uh, sunrise oh, hasn't happened yet. This is just beautiful. This is a beautiful view. This is the Kennedy Turn Basin where we brought in the shuttle main external tank and also uh, brought in the core stage for the Artemis uh, mission, and uh, that's going to be a great one. Yeah, so much coming up uh, here on the Space Coast. Uh, we heard a little earlier from Lucy's project manager. Now here's a recap in her own words about the work it took to get Lucy into the sky. The Lucy mission is a planetary mission to the Trojan asteroids that are around Jupiter. It's going to survey actually a total of eight targets, seven asteroids around Jupiter and one asteroid in the main asteroid belt. Once you know where you're going and the type of science that you want to take, one of the things that you start looking at is the spacecraft what size spacecraft, where is it going, how much power does it need to carry, does it need solar arrays, what type of solar arrays, what type of vehicle is going to be used to launch it into space, so that dictates how much mass you can carry. I and mean, one of the things I do as a project manager is to assemble a team of scientists and engineers and technicians and business people to design that overall spacecraft to achieve your mission. In designing the spacecraft, you are always thinking about what type of environment is it going to be subjected to. Is it going to orbit around Earth? Is it going into deep space? Is it going to Mars? Is it going close to the sun? And so as engineers, uh, one of the things that you're thinking about very early on is how can you design this system and test this system in order to verify and convince yourself that it's going to survive in space. And as part of that, uh, it goes through a very rigorous test program. And so we call it uh, shaking and baking. And so we actually put it through what we call a thermal vac chamber in which we simulate the space environment. We also put it on what we call a vibe table in which we vibrate it so we shake it. And one of the important things that you have to do in order to be convinced that it's going to survive is to make sure that the environment in which you're testing it in, the simulate environment, is harsher than what it's going to see in space. So once you subject that spacecraft or that instrument to that environment, then you can have confidence that it's going to last the lifetime that it's been designed for. All right. Thank you very much, ladies. As you can see at the bottom of your screen, we are counting down to confirmation of solar array deploy and acquisition of signal. Just about eight minutes to go in that. Now, many of NASA's unique science missions have one thing in common, and that is the launch services program that helps each mission take flight. LSP is the common thread. Since the dawn of humanity, we have looked to the stars and dreamed of bridging the gap between the Earth and the cosmos. In the 20th century, NASA turned that dream into a reality by launching humanity into a bold era of scientific discovery. As pioneers of space travel, our best and brightest designed and built everything from the ground up, from launch pads to rockets all of which were government-owned and operated. As NASA's science and robotics evolved, we encouraged a competitive launch market to develop, ushering in a new way to explore and discover through commercial spaceflight. Spacecraft customers from around the world, all with the same desire, reached out to find an expert at NASA for support. Thus, NASA's Launch Services Program was born. Our mission is to centralize NASA's launch services and address state-of-the-art customer needs when placing their spacecraft in orbit around the Earth, the Sun, or destinations deeper into the solar system. The LSP family is made up of a diverse tapestry of government and contractor engineers, analysts, operation experts, and business advisors, all united by a common goal. 
to get your spacecraft off the ground on time, on budget, and successfully to its final destination, wherever that may be. We match scientific and robotic spacecraft with the appropriate rocket and certify rocket performance and reliability. We support full-service missions, advisory services, and one-of-a-kind contracts. The Launch Services Program is the common thread that bridges the spacecraft organization to the rocket designer and the spacecraft to the rocket. We provide long-term technical leadership and expertise from pre-mission planning to system verification and validation all the way through launch. Whatever the vision or requirements, our team will be there, guiding our customers every step of the way on their journey through space. We are the common thread that connects the science world to the physical world by putting the necessary instruments in place. The thread that weaves NASA's industry-leading knowledge and support into the fabric of the commercial space market. We unite customers, capabilities, and culture to explore space through unparalleled launch services. NASA's Launch Services Program. We are Earth's bridge to space. All right, we are now at launch plus one hour, 21 minutes, and just under five minutes away uh, from what we hope will be ac acquisition of signal. We're still inside that 22 minutes of terror when we don't know that yet. That's why I say we hope we'll find out uh, in about four minutes now. We will be checking in with the launch team in just a minute, but before we do that, NASA's launch services program has a really busy rest of 2021 planned. Here's a preview of what's ahead. Since 1998, NASA's Launch Services Program, or LSP, has served as Earth's bridge to space. Based at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, the program matches scientific and robotic spacecraft with launch vehicles for some of America's most inspiring space missions. Our mission, to successfully place spacecraft in orbit around the Earth, the Sun, and destinations deeper into the solar system. We centralize NASA's launch services while addressing state-of-the-art customer needs. But LSP does more than pair spacecraft with the appropriate rocket. The diverse group of government and contractor engineers, analysts, and advisors certify rocket performance and reliability. The team provides long-term technical expertise and support to spacecraft customers from around the world. The team manages launches from multiple sites, depending on customer and mission needs. Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, Reagan Test Site at Kwajalein Atoll in the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Pacific Spaceport Complex in Kodiak, Alaska. Building off of past success, LSP forges ahead to support NASA's future. Lucy will be the first mission to study Jupiter's Trojan asteroids, which may be remnants of the primordial material that formed the outer planets of our solar system. It's then back to the West Coast for Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART, NASA's first planetary defense mission. That will be followed by Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or ICSPI, launching from Kennedy. ICSPI will expand our understanding of X-ray production in objects such as neutron stars and black holes. Years of testing, determination, and dedication, working as one. NASA's Launch Services Program is Earth's Bridge to Space. All right, just about two and a half minutes until we hopefully finish Solar Array Deploy. Two minutes after that, we're expecting to get the acquisition of Signal as we dawn here. The beautiful shot behind us, Marie, of uh, the sun getting ready to rise yeah. here at the Kennedy Space Center, the Kennedy Turn Basin behind us. What a beautiful sight. Yeah, storybook picture behind us. Uh, and as you saw in that video, the next mission for NASA's Launch Services Program is the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. We Fun call one. that DART. Um, that's currently scheduled to lift off November 23rd. I think it's uh, Thanksgiving Eve it uh, over yeah. on the West Coast, Vandenberg uh, Space Force Base. So uh, we're, we're really excited for that one. And more uh, details you can find on that at nasa.gov forward slash DART. And so 
while we stand by to find out more information about the situation with Lucy, we want to just say, hey, this is a long journey ahead of right. her, but these moments right here are very critical, especially that confirming of that solar array deploying. Mm -hmm. So let's toss it over to Joshua and Mick over at the ASOC, who will talk us through it. Guys? Yeah, thanks, Daryl. Uh, man, what an exciting year ahead. Uh, obviously, we'd love to talk about that, but we need to focus on what's at hand. Uh, one minute left. Again, this is the anticipated time to complete the solar array deploy. Uh, Mick, I think we did hear that there is a good call on beginning that process. Yeah, the team is getting some low rate data, and uh, we did hear from the spacecraft project that they had begun that project on time. So, uh, as you said, we're hoping here in about uh, 50 seconds to hear that solar array deploy is complete. And as Daryl mentioned, two minutes after that, we get full acquisition of signal to check out the uh, health of Lucy. And we should hear that uh, come in from uh, spacecraft uh, project manager to our NASA launch manager uh, to make sure that Lucy is, is good. Yeah, we, we did get that call. We weren't sure if we would hear a call for beginning solar array deploy because yeah. uh, we were we did kind of I don't know I don't want to say lucked out because there's no <laughs> luck here, uh, but we we were fortunate to get that low rate data. We may not get full confirmation until we do get that acquisition of signal, which although that clock is almost at zero, may not be for a couple more minutes. Um, as we wait here, Mick, uh, communicating back to Earth is a challenge, and we kind of saw a little bit about that um, from one of our guests talking about when you're close to Earth, it's speed of light, uh, but ultimately. Uh, it's always speed of light, but that's a lot easier when you're close to Earth. You yeah. get farther away. There's different communication mechanisms. Yeah. yeah, so for today's mission, we actually utilize the TDRS network, the Telemetry Data Relay Satellite Network that NASA owns uh, for the vehicle telemetry and for some of the spacecraft data that we've started. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and as Lucy moves on its way uh, out towards the asteroids, we'll take advantage of the Deep Space Network or the set of ground stations here on Earth that have huge, huge satellites that can pick up the smallest and faintest uh, sound from space. So uh, that is a huge asset that we have uh, within the NASA and aerospace uh, industry to be able to work with satellites that travel this far as, as Lucy is doing. Yeah, again, hoping now within a couple minutes to hear from Lucy. I uh, want to emphasize that just because we, if we don't hear that quickly, that's not necessarily a bad sign. Uh, there's a big window here when we know that that acquisition of signal might take place. So uh, we will kind of try and stay with you as long as uh, it makes sense. Uh, but again, that's kind of the nature of spaceflight. Again, it's not about luck. It is, it is about science, and there's lots of factors at play. Yeah, the t like I said earlier, the team has done a great job of designing this trajectory and working, and so far all the predictions have been right on, on target. So uh, as the spacecraft team works through their thing, uh, their, their steps, um, there is this another 20 minutes, roughly, uh, that we could get signal or it could go as late as, uh, you know, hour 55 after, after uh, liftoff. So we'll stay around and, and look at what's going on, but the team is definitely uh, still looking at that and working it. Um, you know, Joshua, I did want to go back. You had asked me earlier when we were off air about spacecraft separation and how simple that was. And it was, you know, basically... It looks simple. It looks simple, but it's very, it's very, uh, it's an engineering feat, and it uses a Marmon clamp that's been around for years. And the Marmon clamp uh, has, a, has an explosive bolt that is released, and the Marmon clamp releases, and Lucy was actually pushed off the front end of Centaur with six separation springs. Uh, so that's, that's a, you know, it sounds very easy, but it's actually a cool, <laughs> it's actually a very cool engineering design that allows us to be able to keep the spacecraft on there for the ride and then separate uh, where they need to go. So I, I wanted to bring that back for the folks on, on, uh, that are watching us. Uh, I think that's just a cool engineering thing uh, that happened in the mission today. Yeah, appreciate those tuning in. Again, we had successful liftoff on time this morning at 5.34 a.m. Eastern Time, and we are standing by now hoping any second to hear uh, that Lucy is alive and well. Uh, but as we, we wait, um, thinking ahead to what's to come, Lucy again headed to eight asteroids around the solar system, one main asteroid belt, uh, and then seven Trojan asteroids. Yeah, and this, is, and this is just the beginning, as we've said earlier, right? The team will get the solar rays out, they'll get acquisition signal. They've got a lot of work to do uh, on orbit, uh, testing out the systems, making sure that their batteries are charged, making sure everything's working. As I mentioned earlier, you know, they're very efficient power usage, 5,000 watts. So they want to make sure all that's working as they're traveling towards these asteroids so that when they get there, that everything works in the sciences. So they'll do checkouts of all the instruments that we talked about on the show today. And uh, the team, the, the spacecraft team, still has a lot of work uh, over the next few months 
in years, 12, yeah. 12 years, right? Yeah. So uh, that's 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 what's upcoming for the spacecraft team. Um, we just saw a little bit ago, you know, we're still focused on Lucy, but uh, the LSP team uh, is beginning to work with our other commercial partners on some missions. Uh, another asteroid mission, DART, uh, which is a cool, I just very think cool. a very cool very mission cool. that we're going to send a, a spacecraft to an asteroid and try to impact its trajectory a little bit. So that's that's uh, looking forward to that mission coming up uh, here very soon. So. Yeah, and uh, looking ahead to, to Lucy's journey, she's, uh, if you're ever frustrated by your cell phone not working <laughs> in a timely fashion, uh, and you're kind of anxious to hear uh, us get this call, uh, a reminder that Lucy's now hurtling away from Earth at greater than escape velocity, which means more than 25,000 miles per hour away from Earth. Uh, yeah. So this is this is much more complicated than even a simple text message that you just can't get to send. Yeah, yeah. no, the teams the teams are definitely paying attention, uh, looking at all the, uh, the stuff they've got and, and watching that the automation on the spacecraft is working. Uh, definitely uh, can tell you that there's probably a little tense moments going on right now um, from that aspect. Um, but uh, we are still waiting to hear uh, if uh, we, we, we hear around us some that, clapping, but I'm not right. sure what that's I for yet. Um, but we are waiting to hear from the spacecraft project manager to the NLM on, uh, on acquisition of signal. So uh, hopefully we'll hear that soon uh, from, from the team. Uh, but uh, definitely something is going on. There's some happy and clapping <laughs> going on here. Uh, I, feel like, uh, I feel like I'm a little in the dark, right? So that's right. That's good. But we'll hear that hopefully very soon uh, from our NLM. So, Mick, as we look ahead to uh, to this process, uh, again, the speeds we're talking about here are pretty uh, exceptional. Um, Lucy will get up to a, a maximum speed of about 400,000 miles per hour. Uh, a lot of that has to do with these gravity assists that they'll, that they'll get uh, the slingshot effect from Earth. Uh, hurtling towards the Trojan asteroids, which are in the same orbit that Jupiter follows. Uh, all right, so I'm seeing some, I'm seeing lots of applause. Uh, I'm hoping that's a good time. We haven't heard the, the word come in yet. So, um, so yeah, I just, I just saw some a movement that yeah, solar rays we're, we're are, completely, yes. are completely deployed. So that's a good uh, thing for the spacecraft team. Solar rays are completely out. And so now we're just waiting on acquisition of signal uh, from the uh, from the team, and you know, Joshua, as we said, um, these things uh, they ran some analysis, and there was some time frame here, and they're within their time frame. So not not necessarily anything happened uh, bad here, but it's uh, going well so far for the Lucy spacecraft. So we'll wait to hear that they get that acquisition signal and determine the final health of uh, the Lucy spacecraft. Yeah, the uh, the Ooh. orbit that we're taking is a very uh, high high elliptical uh, where it will come around uh, near Earth and then slingshot out into the Trojan asteroids uh, in the same orbit as Jupiter, um, so that the apogee of that orbit uh, would end up being kind of the slowest point uh, of, of Lucy's motion, and Jupiter and the Trojans move at a speed of roughly 29,000 miles per hour in their orbit around the Sun. So uh, that kind of gives you a sense of the incredible speed that you have to build up so that at your slowest point, you're doing that. Um, so again, an incredible, just, uh, trajectory and engineering feat to be prepared uh, to, to, to rely on Lucy to fly freely for 12 years. That's something that a lot of people might have a misconception about, is that Lucy's not under powered flight for 12 years. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's not like uh, they can change trajectory during this time, right? We have put them on a uh, where they needed to be by the specific designed trajectory it needs to be. And with those massive solar arrays out there, they can't make very many, uh, they can't make any maneuvers out there. So Lucy is on her way with solar rays deployed and uh, things are, are going well uh, so far. We're just still waiting to hear. Like I said, we, we keep hearing some clapping in the background that we know that some of that is solar ray deployment and we're just waiting to hear that they've acquired signal of the spacecraft and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, and it's it's looking like that word is in. Uh, I, I noticed there the folks in, in that room that you're seeing on screen have taken off their headsets. That is usually a sign that we are good to go here. Uh, so uh, I believe we're, we're good. We're going to send this out to Daryl now. Um, so Mick, that's going to do it for you and me here. Appreciate you riding along with me, Mick. Uh, until next time. Yeah, Joshua, thank you. This was an exciting mission. Very happy for the spacecraft team so far and the launch uh, LSP and the United Launch Alliance teams. Looking forward to our next mission, DART. Awesome. Signing off from the ASOC, Daryl, back to you.
Thank you, Joshua and Mick. And in the upper right-hand part of that picture, it was nice to see how Levison and Danya Douglas Bradshaw yeah. celebrating the big moment of acquisition of Signal. Yeah, Huge. finally able to breathe a sigh of relief. Yep. Uh, and now here's a special preview of NASA's next Launch Services Program science mission launching next month. It's the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. <laughs> Looking forward to the DART mission. Got to make those travel plans out to California. We'll have it for you here on NASA TV. For now, though, we want to go back to the NASA launch manager, and he is with our own Franklin Fitzgerald. Yes, I'm here with uh, Omar Baez, who's the senior launch director for the Lucy mission. Uh, Omar, how did things go this morning? Things were splendid today. Everything went on time uh, as predicted, and uh, I couldn't ask for, for a better count. It uh, just clicked off the way it should, um, and uh, we, we really worked no major issues. So we were able to hit the window at the very beginning, on the very first day of the uh, short window for Lucy, so we're, we're happy to be here at this point. I understand you were wrapping up a few things before you were able to come up. Um, everybody just got up and left. What does that mean? That means things are really good. <laughs> so what that means is both uh, solar arrays uh, have deployed, and we did lock on to the acquisition si uh, signal from the spacecraft. So the uh, folks at Goddard and Lockheed Martin Denver are controlling now mm -hmm. and have positive uh, control over the spacecraft. So uh, that's the best uh, shape you want to be in. Uh, right before you came on, they rolled a package talking about DART. That's the next mission for LSP. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? So that one is so cool for us. Uh, DART is going to um, kinetically hit an asteroid. And uh, it's our second uh, planetary mission from the West Coast or Vandenberg. So super exciting. Uh, just another a different way of uh, spotting an asteroid and, and this time we're trying to to go in the aspect of not studying it but uh, planetary defense could we move uh, an asteroid if we needed to and so this is super cool and a, and a whole different uh, way of operating for us so we love it Omar Baez congratulations on a successful launch and uh are you going to be the launch director in, uh, for DART? I will be the launch director for DART and after DART we have Ixby from this coast and that's going to be a cool one for launch services program also because it's our first KSC launch. We're a program that's been at KSC for 23 years and we've never launched anything from the Kennedy Space Center, our very first from Complex 39A. Oh, that's going to be awesome. We'll be there for that. Hopefully we'll have you on the show then again as well. Okay. Thank Omar you. Baez, thanks for being with us today. Guys, back to you. Omar and Franklin, thank you. And as you look behind us, you see the dawn of a new day. <laughs> and there's the dawn of Lucy and her journey to the Trojan asteroid seems very fitting. Yeah, what a, what a nice tribute from Mother Earth to Lucy, uh, the fossil and the spacecraft now about to uncover uh, secrets of our beginnings. Indeed. Uh, so we're going to leave you with a replay of this morning's liftoff. Uh, and you can also follow along live mission updates online at nasa.gov forward slash Lucy. Have a great weekend. And keep looking up. That's my line, Maria.
seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. Atlas V takes flight, sending Lucy to uncover the fossils of our solar system. All clear. I have a, a feather in my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather. Flashing across California desert skies, the airplanes you see here are writing new chapters in the story of man-made flight. There she goes. This is my first opportunity to greet you as Deputy Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Together, you and I must make our new agency the most unusual place. An organization that can challenge conventional wisdom. We can engineer anything. We can write the requirements for We're going to make your idea work. This particular idea is quite disruptive. A typical flight, of course, starts under the wing of the B-52 mothership. This sleek, high-speed machine would have made Rube Goldberg proud. The manner in which we fly re-entry from space on the space shuttle was pioneered on the X-15. The X-31 pretty much wrote the book on thrust vectoring, along with its sister program, the F-18. Hard. An observation of an occupation is one of the more challenging missions that Sophia can do. Right now, we are looking at the dawn of new era of aviation. Most early inventors thought that flight control can be achieved by a pilot simply shifting his weight back and forth. The Wrights, on the other hand, knew that controlling the plane was the key to successful flight. Release plate, throttle to afterburn. Watch exhaust temperature. Watch nozzle position. Check engine pressure ratio now. And all this time, steer down the runway, first nose wheel steer, then rudder. Lift nose wheel at just the proper speed to fly off in the least ground roll. Today, man copes with a highly complex environment with physical abilities no better than he has ever had. Greater demands on the air crew call for ever closer relationships between man and machine. Until now, all flyers have used the force of their muscles, multiplied by gears and motors, to adjust wing and tail surfaces. Your landing gear and flaps are operated hydraulically. It's about 45 pounds of force to get that stick to move. It's, it's, it's a very athletic endeavor. An advanced flight control system called the Digital Fly-By-Wire System has been installed by the Flight Research Center in a modified F-8 jet aircraft. The pilot of this experimental aircraft need only indicate the desired flight path to a computer, which then calculates and actually executes the control changes needed to stay on course. The heart of the control system is a digital computer and an inertial measuring unit that were developed for the flight control system of the Apollo Lunar Module. 
Use of this kind of control system could make air travel of the future smoother and safer by reducing aircraft vibration caused by turbulent air through automatic response from the computer to the aircraft control. We used an F-111 for integrated engine control. Further mechanization hopes to make more optimum blending of airframe and propulsion system control. A computer-controlled flight system, along with some new control surfaces, allow this modified F-16 to maneuver laterally, change altitude without pointing its nose, and perform other unconventional maneuvers. The Deke system is full authority, digital electronic control. The fastest calculation loop in the control is 24 milliseconds. At Dryden, we had been working integrated controls here over a number of years, so we decided to see if we could extend our integrated control approach to, to let the engines do all of the flight control. When Gordon Fullerton lands an F-15 and he hasn't touched the control surfaces, all the people who said it was impossible suddenly don't have a lot to say anymore. This will be invaluable on military and commercial aircraft of the future. You can bring it in not for just a survivable crash landing, but a precise, normal landing, which is what we did with absolutely no motion of any uh, external flight controls, purely by modulation of the engine thrust. Using neural networks to identify aircraft stability parameters and to optimize control performance during test flights, will reduce development and program costs. A neural network is a computer program comprised of a series of examples, and in our particular case, these examples are previous flight data. The power by wire actuators only draw power when the aircraft is maneuvering, so that saves a great deal of energy, which an aircraft translates to fuel. This new software allowed the aircraft's flight control computer to minimize drag by automatically determining the best setting for thrust vectoring nozzles and aerodynamic controls. Thrust vectoring is the ability to direct an aircraft thrust for directional control, rather than relying on conventional control surfaces alone. The intelligent flight control experiment, to be tested in early 1999, seeks to enable aircraft control systems to adapt to unforeseen changes in aircraft operating conditions. In addition to advanced controls research, the FAST system allows for simulating system failures. Data from NASA's Integrated Resilient Aircraft Controls, or IRAC project, will be used to design and develop aviation systems better enabled to safely fly and land damaged aircraft. One promising technology that may make it possible to improve both aircraft safety and performance is active stabilization of flutter using advanced flight control systems. A change of command aboard the space station getting curious for World Space Week and expanding commercial opportunities in space. A few of the stories to tell you about this week at NASA. On October 4th aboard the International Space Station, Expedition 65 Commander Akihiko Hoshide of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency officially handed over command of the station to European Space Agency astronaut Toma Pesquet. Pesquet will command the station until he departs aboard the SpaceX Crew Dragon Endeavour spacecraft in mid to late November with Hoshide and NASA astronauts Megan MacArthur and Shane Kimbrough. Get Curious with Vice President Harris is a YouTube Originals video released on October 7th to kick off World Space Week. It follows a group of kids as they meet the Vice President and go on a scavenger hunt with clues delivered by our Shane Kimbrough from the International Space Station. The Vice President is the Chair of the National Space Council. On October 5th, Roscosmos cosmonaut Anton Shkaparov, Russian actress Yulia Parishil, and producer Klim Shapenko launched to the space station from Kazakhstan. Several hours later, the Expedition 65 crew welcomed the trio aboard the orbiting outpost. The actress and producer are filming scenes aboard the station for a movie as part of a commercial agreement that marks the expansion of commercial space opportunities to include feature filmmaking. We previewed NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission during a pair of virtual briefings October 6th and 7th. Crew-3 is the next crew rotation flight of a U.S. commercial spacecraft with astronauts to the International Space Station. 
NASA's Rajashari, Tom Marsburn, and Kayla Barron, along with European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Maurer, are targeted for launch to the station October 30th from our Kennedy Space Center. Meanwhile, NASA has reassigned astronauts Nicole Mann and Josh Cassata to our SpaceX Crew-5 mission, expected to launch to the space station no earlier than fall 2022. Mann and Cassata previously were assigned to missions on NASA's Boeing Crew Flight Test and NASA's Boeing Starliner 1 mission, respectively. The team for our Lucy mission invites you to create your very own time capsule for the mission and share it online using the hashtag LucyTimeCapsule. The plan is to revisit your time capsule at future mission milestones for personal reflection and or to maybe add new items. The Lucy spacecraft will carry a time capsule that includes a plaque inscribed with words of wisdom on its 12-year odyssey to several asteroids, including the never-before-explored Trojan asteroids that share an orbit with Jupiter. Lucy is targeted for launch no earlier than October 16th. On October 7th, award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien hosted El Aya y El Mañana, which translates to Yesterday and Tomorrow in English. The NASA Hispanic Heritage Month event featured a conversation about the new National Museum of the American Latino, NASA's impact and influence, and the pioneering spirit of Latinos on NASA television, the NASA app, and the agency's website. On October 2nd and 3rd, NASA collaborated with several space agency partners for the 10th International Space Apps Challenge, which was entirely virtual. Each year, the event, which is recognized as the largest annual hackathon in the world, engages thousands of people around the globe to work with the agency's open source data to answer some of the most pressing challenges on Earth and in space. Space Apps is managed by NASA's Earth Science Division. That's what's up this week at NASA. For more on these and other stories, follow us on the web at nasa.gov slash twan. Hubble has been able to observe objects way out to almost about the edge of the universe, about 13 and a half billion light years. Hubble was never designed or thought it could see that far out, but because of the advances in the instruments that we've been able to put up on the telescope, and also the cleverness of the scientists, they've come up with very interesting observing scenarios, doing these really deep exposures where we just sit there for orbit after orbit after orbit, gathering the photons. We've been able to push Hubble out very, very far. These very, very deep exposures that Hubble has been able to take, we have seen right to the edge of the universe. 13 and a half you know, billion years. Advancing today's space communication and navigation services and technologies to meet tomorrow's challenges, SCAN is committed to ensuring vital space communications through a network of complex ground stations and tracking data relay satellites. Together, these systems enable continuous communications and global coverage for space programs. Every space mission delivers terabytes of vital information for the process of scientific discovery. Our extensible and expandable communication and navigation infrastructure provides a resilient space framework that can meet the growing requirements of our users. We develop, operate, manage, and engineer pioneering solutions. Transformational technologies in satellite communications are underway. Cognitive systems will enable autonomous satellite networks, and optical communications will increase our ability to send and receive data to the vastness of space. We are developing these and other technologies to advance explorations of Earth, the lunar region, and beyond. Spectrum, the medium that enables communications and navigation through coordination we ensure efficient use of this limited resource. We work with P&T partners to provide space missions accurate position and timing information. 
The most exciting part of this journey lies ahead, collaborating with commercial industry on major advancements in space communications. Our next generation of visionaries are creating a bright future, enabling Artemis lunar communications and a pathway to Mars, NASA space communications and navigation. Scan. Exploration enabled. The Lucy mission is going to fly past seven asteroids in 12 years with one spacecraft. We are going to an amazing variety of objects with this mission. And it's really almost pure luck that allowed us to get as many rich targets as we are. Literally, the planets were aligning to allow us to do this mission. The Lucy mission is named after the Lucy fossil, the Australopithecus fossil, that was discovered in the 1970s in Ethiopia. And just like the Lucy fossil transformed our understanding of hominid evolution, the Lucy mission will transform our understanding of solar system evolution. Trojan asteroids are an interesting population of small bodies that are left over from the formation of the planets. And they... <laughs>